one. And why is the most publicly accused and found liable abuser, Donald Trump, seem to get away with it all? You can call or text. I'm Marjorie Egan. After that is NBC Sports Boston's Trenny Casey on the end of March Madness, the Red Sox no good, very bad opening day, and how sports betting is changing the way college athletes play. All that and more ahead. Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, live from the Boston Public Library. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Corva Coleman. President Biden has welcomed Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida to the White House. The two will have a day of discussion before going to an official state dinner. Biden thanked Kishida for Japan's close cooperation with the U.S., including support for Ukraine. Prime Minister is a visionary and courageous leader. When Russia began its brutal invasion of Ukraine two years ago, he did not hesitate to condemn sanction and isolate Russia and provide billions in assistance to Ukraine. But Biden and Kishida have differences. One of them is the takeover of the American company U.S. Steel by Japan's Nippon Steel. The takeover of U.S. Steel is also opposed by several congressional Democrats. The Environmental Protection Agency is setting limits on a persistent chemical in the drinking water. NPR's Ping Huang reports on why the government is regulating PFAS now. PFAS are a large group of man-made chemicals that are used to make things waterproof and stain-proof. EPA Administrator Michael Regan says that has come at a cost to human health. These forever chemicals can accumulate in the body over time. And long-term exposure to certain types of PFAS have been linked to serious illnesses, including cancer, liver damage, and high cholesterol. The EPA is setting the limits for a handful of common PFAS at 4 to 10 parts per trillion, depending on the chemical. Water systems will have to monitor for these chemicals and remove them if they're found. Experts say this is a big first step in removing a source of PFAS exposure for up to 100 million people. Ping Huang, NPR News. Officials in California say homelessness in that state has risen by more than 180,000 people over the last several years. That's despite the state spending billions of dollars to try to reduce the numbers. For member station KQED, Vanessa Rancano reports on the findings of a state auditor. Most people coming off the streets were placed in temporary housing, according to the state audit, and 44 percent of them ended up homeless again. It also found there wasn't enough information about some of the state's key homelessness programs to know whether they're effective. State Senator Dave Cortezi of San Jose requested the review. And we think that in the days ahead, this audit will establish somewhat of a blueprint for legislative direction and guardrails going forward. The report recommends lawmakers take steps to require better reporting by state agencies. It comes as the state has spent nearly $24 billion over the past five years to address homelessness and housing affordability. For NPR News, I'm Vanessa Rancaño. On Wall Street, stocks are sharply lower. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 380 points, nearly 1 percent. The Nasdaq is also down more than 1 percent. This is NPR. Good morning. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. A Brookline woman who allegedly defaced signs at two MBTA stations with anti-Zionist messages has been charged with vandalism. According to the MBTA police report, 29-year-old Mindy Valerin, who was uh, recently fired from her job at the T, allegedly spray-painted station maps and walls at Longwood and Kenmore stations last Thursday. The vandalism on a map at the Green Line Longwood station in Brookline read Zionist pigs, while the platform wall at Kenmore station was spray-painted with the word Zionist. Brookline Select Board Chair Bernard Green calls the graffiti anti-Semitic and an attack on the Jewish community. A passenger standing on the platform at Longwood captured a photo of her spray-painting the map at Longwood on Thursday, and she admitted to the vandalism the next day, telling police that Zionism represents how she's being treated and how Zionism is the Jewish nationalist movement in support of a Jewish national state in Palestine. She was charged with vandalism and was issued a summons to Brookline District Court.
Tonight, the MBTA will host a public meeting to update Fall River residents on Phase 1 of the South Coast Rail Project. It's expected to add 36 miles of commuter rail service connecting Fall River and New Bedford to Boston. Those with the T said last year that passenger service would begin by this summer 2024. You can find out um, tonight at 6 at Morton Middle School in Fall River. 58 degrees in Boston. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, working to target and destroy cancer-causing proteins with protein degradation. It's how Dana-Farber is working to treat previously untreatable cancers. DanaFarber.org slash everywhere. Welcome to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live at the Boston Public Library. We're here now Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Today is Wednesday. Fridays. Did I say that wrong? You Tuesday, said Tuesday, Wednesdays, yeah. and Fridays. Sorry Thank about you. that. Oh, it was only one day it's off, It's only actually. one day off. That's right. <laughs> Sorry, but we're not here tomorrow, just to be clear. But we are here Friday. <laughs> uh, we're also streaming on YouTube.com slash GBH News on Friday when we are back here. Mm -hmm. We're going to have Ask the Tease GM. Philip Eng is going to mm -hmm. be here from 11 to 12 here at the Boston Public Library to take our questions and yours. We're very excited about that. Uh, uh, we're not here next Tuesday, the day after the marathon, but we'll be back on Wednesday with Ask the Governor. More healing. Turn Attorney General. Oh, God, I'm really messing this whole thing up. Is this show on the air, or are we just Sorry. rehearsing? I can't Sorry. remember. Sorry. Ask the Attorney General. That's Andrea Campbell from 1 to 2. Special show on May 3rd. I'm going to try to get this one correct. Mm -hmm. Live from UMass Boston. That's where Governor Healy is going to be here. And Gina McCarthy used to have the Former EPA. Former head of the EPA, yeah. Yeah, she's going to be with us. So uh, I'll hand it over to you now, Jim. Well, let me just say, <laughs> if I may, we're either here tomorrow or not. Uh, that's number one. That's one of the yeah. two. I know that to be We're true. We're not here tomorrow. And next Wednesday, either the governor is joining yeah. us or the attorney general. Uh, one of the, the two. Attorney general. Attorney general. Yeah, attorney so, general. Yeah, I, let me just say, I'm coming to your defense. Uh -huh. Thank uh, you. Jim. You were not that far off. <laughs> You're just one position in terms of constitutional yeah. officers okay. and one day in terms of the uh, library. Do you have anything more to say? Or no, is that I, a, think I, I think I, I think you I did quit enough. While I'm ahead. Enough damage right yeah, there. Yeah, that's right. So seven years ago, Matt Lauer, remember the Today Show. I was fired from NBC for allegations that he was a serial sexual harasser, abuser, and even a rapist. The allegations that cost him his job were serious. On one end, he gave a colleague a sex toy as a present and included an explicit note about how he wanted to use it on her. And I'm sure you remember from Ronan Farrow's book, we actually talked to him about it, that a uh, producer at NBC News credibly accused Lauer of rape at the uh, Sochi Olympics. I think it was in 2014. The week he was fired, Lauer released a statement saying he was, quote, truly sorry that there was enough truth in the allegations to make him feel embarrassed and ashamed, I should say so. But now he says it's actually him, he, who was owed an apology for the way he has been treated these past few years. He thinks he deserves another shot in the media, apparently as if it's some God-given right to be on morning TV. So the lines are open at 877-301-8970. Should any of the Me Too abusers have a second chance. And we're not talking about Harvey Weinstein types. We're talking about others. When and how we determine that someone is, I guess you could say, quote, served their time. And I guess the corollary is, do they ever? Uh, and why did none of these rules uh, ever seem to apply to a serial sexual uh, harasser, abuser, and uh, even arguably rapist, Donald Trump. The number's 877-301-8970. Can I get the Matt Lauer thing out of the yep, way? Yep, Remember our favorite cartoon ever in The New Yorker, How's Never is Never Good for You? <laughs> yeah. If you don't take responsibility for horrible uh, behavior and at least don't apologize for it, you don't even begin the conversation as to when you're allowed to re-enter society. He's done neither, so I think he's not even in the discussion. The question applies, you know, there are people like Louis C.K. who right. did something disgusting and worse when he, if you excuse the expression, masturbated in front of some women. He didn't mm -hmm. touch them, but he did that. I guess he's begun, he's a Newton guy, begun to come back. Uh, a little bit Jeffrey Tubin while fired for The New Yorker for what he did on that uh, video on that Zoom call or something yeah, like that. he didn't that. have his pants on. He's back at, uh, he did not, and he did more. He's back at CNN. But the question is, you know, I, and I think I said this a couple of years in, for, for the non, let's call them the non-Harvey Weinsteins, in some ways you were better to be charged with a crime, convicted, 
and sentence so that at some point you can say, I've done my time. Mm -hmm. A lot of these uh, guys, uh, I assume some of whom have acted responsibly and apologized and sought some sort of uh, uh, forgiveness, for lack of a better expression, not that they're entitled to it, from the women uh, that they uh, abused, uh, uh, might be entitled to a second chance. I, you know, I, I think my threshold position, I haven't thought a lot about this, they're not entitled to go back to what they did. I mean, this yeah. notion, forget, I mean, Lauer is in, uh, humiliating. You read the, what was it called, Catch and Kill? You read Ronan the Ronan Farrow's Farrow book. book. Yep. I mean, this guy is guilty as sin. And, also that and the notion that he wants an, an apology, apology is, a little, is so grotesque. Is a she said it's embarrassing for him to be out with his new girlfriend. Yeah. Well, I guess I guess she's not so new. She's been with him for a few years, but you know that's sort of them's the breaks. You know, he was the highest paid uh, talent on on a news show back when he got fired. I did not. Watch your mind, people. What he had under his desk in his office too. Well, he had this this buzzer thing that he could lock his door from the ins. I guess his office at NBC was kind of secluded. Mm -hmm. And he could lock his door from the inside. So what he apparently would do, in addition to these horrible things you've mentioned, his, he'd invite women into his office and talk to them about sex and stuff like that. But he locked the door so that people couldn't overhear him, or in some and cases, and that the women couldn't get so out. The women couldn't get out. So that that was pretty bad. But you know, it's it's uh, Jeffrey Tubin did did something really stupid, being on uh, not his pants on and. Something else. Something else on, on to himself. <laughs> a Zoom meeting during the pandemic, which was really bad. Um, but he's back now on CNN. At least I've seen him a few times. No, he is back on CNN. And I think he is. He's not able. back at the New Yorker, by the way. They fire him, nope. and he's fired. But he is a brilliant analyst, and I must say, uh, I'm glad to see him back. Uh, he did something nothing like what what Laura did, but you still do think about that sometimes when you see him. But he's a brilliant, brilliant analyst. So in his case. Um, I'm glad he's back. I, I don't think what he did is, is a life sentence, and I think he's really talented at what he does. He but don't you agree that the, that the first steps are to take full responsibility, which, to apologize, seek forgiveness, mm -hmm. which may not be forthcoming, and then the discussion begins. But until those three steps have been taken, you don't, you're not even in the... There was that New York Times reporter, Glenn uh, Thrush, Thrush, is that his name? Yes. Who was suspended for a while. His behavior was on the opposite end of the offensive and inappropriate mm -hmm. uh, uh, and clearly sexual harassment uh, accused of uh, uh, kissing, I think, some colleagues, right. hand on the thigh right. kind of thing. He was suspended. Ultimately, he was given his job back, even though I don't think he went back to the White House. But if I remember correctly, he was pretty apologetic. And uh, uh, it, it, that, again, I'm not even sure. There's no entity. There's no fit place for uh, uh, these guys who truly are contrite, who have sought forgiveness, well, to she's, go, you she's know? an interesting case, I thought, that was in uh, one of the pieces I read this morning, I think it was The Guardian, talking about Mel Gibson, who became kind of persona non grata after he went on this anti-Semitic, anti sexist stuff, yeah. tirade. Um, and uh, he, but he gave a, many remorseful interviews and uh, for the initial incident said he was uh, very, very sorry. Then he went on to direct a successful film that he got, that was even nominated, he was even nominated for an Oscar. But the piece makes the point, he is no longer the superstar that he was. So he's come back somewhat after these many interviews and remorse, and it was a tirade, it wasn't touching uh -huh. anybody, or it wasn't certainly any kind of sex crime. I think that's kind of interesting. He's back, but he's not back to where well, he was. Well, I, I, I'm not sure this is right. If there's an exception, I'm sure someone will call us at 877-301-8970. Other than Donald Trump, is there any of these, uh, are there any of these men who have, as you say, come back to where they were before, whether they deserve it or not is another question. I don't think there's anybody who has achieved their prior status, and I think I'm fine with that. Uh, uh, well, there it, may be an exception, but the, the one exception, all rules, is uh, Donald Trump. I mean, he is yeah. a serial abuser, credibly accused, and he was elected even though people right. knew about it, and now he's on the verge of being reelected. Yeah, well, let's hope he's not going to be reelected, but he's, he's looking pretty good, unfortunately, for him at the moment. Jill Pilipovich, I love her yeah, stuff. She's, she's great. a great. Uh, uh, writer about uh, all sorts of things, a lot about women's issues. Um, as she said um, that they should stop thinking about trying to make comebacks and what they should do is make amends. 
And, she, and I think this is a great point. If someone has paid a penance for their wrongdoing, they do not deserve to have their lives ruined. But losing one's celebrity is not ruination, nor is it penitence. By suggesting that it is, too many men of the Me Too movement show they haven't changed much at all. So I agree. Well, it's like yeah. Matt Lauer, as I said in the beginning, thinks he's entitled to go back into television. He is obviously not. Regardless, particularly with his behavior. Let's take some calls. 877-301-8970. And again, the inspiration for this, the news hook, is Lauer saying he deserves an apology and it's time for him to make his comeback. What are you laughing about? <laughs> Heather's got an unusual idea. They should all be on the same show. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. Do you remember? Tina Brown. Tina Brown yes. reached out to Charlie Rose, who was a late night host, who was accused of what walking around naked or with his robe open in his front bathrobe, of yeah. current employees, not right. to mention some sexual harassment. She initiated the notion of a show in which he would interview right. people like himself, Matt Lauer, and all these other people. And obviously that uh, didn't come to pass, which is perfectly fine. Paul, Paul and Hingham, he thank you for calling. Hi, Paul. Hey. Hi. Um, hi. I, I have to say, I w lived near somebody who had similar behavior and was actually, still is actually, a domestic violence advocate in Massachusetts. And... Um, the thing I noticed in his behavior was that uh, there's, there's, there's no guilt or remorse or something for people with that sort of borderline. It's like a borderline sociopathy. Like in their minds, they're entitled. They're the victim, and other people are unfairly accusing them, and yeah. they actually feel sorry for themselves. Like Matt Lauer doesn't, he actually feels sorry for himself. He sees himself as the victim. Here. He does. So what's the, uh, what's the end game? Uh, what's the end? Well, I mean, for these, it's also, if you don't admit that there's any wrong or error, and in, in unless you actually film doing it, then it's very easy to say oh, nothing happened, right? Uh, yeah. By the way, one example uh, I'm looking. Louis C.K. apologized. Says he was remorseful has uh, tried to learn from his irresponsible behavior. I believe, if I remember correctly, that he spent some time away from even attempting to get back into the comedy field so he allegedly could reflect on his misbehavior. And, you know, that, uh, I, again, I think that's the first step. It's not enough, but it is, uh, it is the first step. Paul, thank you. I think your analysis is totally right. A lot of these guys, obviously Matt Lauer, see themselves as the victim as opposed to the abuser, the bully, et cetera. Paul, thank you for the call. 877-301-8970 is the number. Here's a, 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 a bill from Portland, Maine. The one man I feel totally was, was steamrolled is former Senator Al Franken. His ouster from the Senate was far more severe than his childish behavior deserves. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand went for the jugular when it wasn't warranted. You know, that's a debatable one. Several people are mentioning... Why don't you describe um, what Al, he did, Al for those Franken. who don't recall? Well, he, 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 he used to be on Saturday Night Live, and then he was in the Senate. There was a picture of him when he was still working as a comedian, standing above a woman making a, like a Was gesture. she asleep at that point, yeah. I think? Yeah, making like this gesture over her breast. He yeah. wasn't touching her. He was making a gesture over her breast. It was pretty stupid and pretty obnoxious, but he was a comedian. Later on, he was also accused maybe when he'd be posing for pictures with people that he maybe had their, his hands and too close to them or something like that. Um, so that. That one is a little bit of a, of a, of a borderline case, too. Um, I could, but it's tough. Are you going to go vote for the guy? I, I don't know. Well, the it's, answer to that, well, but you're broaching what a lot of people think is the appropriate thing, which is let the people of Minnesota decide if they're going to go vote for the guy. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the comparison, and again, I'm not arguing that no discipline was appropriate. The de fellow Democrats, led by Senator Gillibrand, mm -hmm. did force Franken out of the Senate, and some people may think it's fine. It's fine if you don't think that it's fine. And yet a totally different set of rules uh, uh, apply to the Republican Party, even after a jury, a court, finds that... Uh, E. Jean Carroll was sexually abused by uh, Donald Trump. Well, Dan from Melrose is pointing out, um, Ted, you're taking you to task. A lot of people have done this mm. before, Jim, about Ted Kennedy, the model for no term limits. And well, it's a lot of people horrible think, what he did, obviously. It, but you know something? That was a time, not, I mean, I, I do believe he left a woman in that car to die, and that was absolutely horrible. But 
that was a time when men get away with anything regarding young women. Well, I mean, not that. Was, that was not just the case of uh, uh, inappropriate sexual behavior. Well, I just said, that, oh, yeah. he left her in a car to yeah, die. Yeah, exactly. So that was, that was not inappropriate sexual behavior, but obviously uh, there was a lot of inappropriate sexual behavior that was known about that people got away with. I mean, the press knew about the most famous cases is JFK. The, uh, you know, Ben Bradley Sr. used to have, had the Washington Post. He knew what Kennedy was doing. And in those you days... You didn't report on those were, things That's then. exactly right. And Dan from Melrose also met in mentions Bill Clinton at Biden's fundraiser last week. Now, Bill Clinton, he's in kind of a gray area. I mean, I think he Well, did. last election cycle, he was invited, to my recollection, to not speak. He was not invited to speak at any uh, Democratic uh, elected, uh, Democratic uh, candidate seeking election to the House or Senate because essentially he was in disgrace. But, and he was propped up a little bit a few weeks ago by Joe Biden at that Radio uh, City thing. But remember when we were at the convention with Barack Obama? I do indeed. And who, who spoke at that convention? Yeah. Bill Clinton. Yeah. I mean, he was like a rock star at, at that uh, convention. So th it, it's, I don't know if it's because people like him or people think he... It, I think he's Congress had a fall from grace. Too I, far with, with um, well, impeachment? Well, I, I think he's credibly accused of rape, don't oh, you? Oh, absolutely. Juanita Broderick. Okay, absolutely. exactly. And, and, you know, people always throw that at us about, about uh, Trump. We did not know about Juanita... Well, Juanita Broderick knew about Juanita yeah. Broderick. But the rest we of the didn't. country That's did correct. not know about Juanita Broderick when Bill Clinton was elected. They knew about Jennifer Flowers. They knew he was having an affair uh, with a lounge singer, as we used to call her, and that Hillary was questioned about it by 60 Minutes and said she was not just standing by her man, yeah. like Tammy uh, Wynette. Al from Rhode Island, what do you think, Al? Hey, Al. Hi. Hi. Uh, long time uh, listener, second time that I'm in to talk to you. Thank you very much for calling. What I want to, uh, what I wanted to say, I, I have treated men convicted of sex offenses. Oh. I researched them. I evaluated them. And I can say that, you know, everybody deserves second chances, but they have to not only apologize, be remorseful, and make amends, but truly understand the impact of their behavior exactly. and where it came from. Like, Mark Lauer, uh, he, you know, he may apologize, but he's not addressing the issues of entitlement, of power, uh, everything that went into his behavior. And unfortunately, we're raising our boys uh, in a way that they want this power, they want this masculinity, and they're sexually aggressive early on. I have a 15-year-old daughter. A number of her friends have been sexually assaulted, you know, by other 15-year-olds. It's really a problem. Yeah, um, Al, thank you. Well, don't go away, Al, since you're an expert in the field. What should we be doing with... Young people, I, I've mentioned this before on the air. When I was a city councilor in Cambridge for one term, I went to an event at Cambridge Ringe, the high school in Cambridge, and I really didn't want to go, but I felt I had to go or I'd be embarrassed as a city councilor not showing up. And it was one of the best things I ever went to. It was a program called STARS. I think it was S-T-A-R-Z. And it was young uh, uh, men and women who had either been the perpetrator or the victim of some sort of sexual assault talking to other young people, meaning peers who had been involved yeah. in this behavior, counseling peers, I thought it was one of the most effective hours and a half I ever spent in my life. What do you think of that kind of thing? Uh, that can be helpful. Uh, ideally, we, we, we start before any of these comes up. You know, having possible, possible, uh, positive male role models yeah. uh, in the media. I mean, th things like Ted Lasso, a man who is emotional, who is vulnerable, mm. uh, who is in touch with their emotions. I mean, at least eventually. I mean, <laughs> we need much more of that. And, uh, and also gender equity. Yeah. In, in societies that, are, that have much more gender equity, there is no aggression towards women. Hey, yeah. Al, you're a fabulous caller. I hope you make your third call soon. That was terrific, and we really appreciate your spending time with us. Thanks so much. 877-301-8970. Okay, we're talking about the, the idea of these Me Too abusers are trying to come back 
uh, into the mainstream or even go back to the positions they used to have. That was apparently what Matt Lauer thinks should be happening to him. After he gets an apology. Yeah, should they, <laughs> right. Should they have a life, a life sentence? When and how do we determine if someone has been rehabilitated and isn't a risk for further abuse and deserves a second chance? And why do none of these rules seem to apply to Donald Trump? The number is 877-301-8970. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, streaming uh, on youtube.com slash GBH News and at the Boston Public Library live. Sami Abu Shahade leads a prominent Palestinian Israeli political party. He has not flinched in criticizing the war in Gaza. The Americans were partners in these crimes against my people because of this blind, uncritical American support for Israel. I'm Marco Werman, reporting from Jerusalem all this week on The World. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Support for our programs comes from you and the Museum of Science, where their new exhibit, Changing Landscapes, an immersive journey, transports you to iconic spots around the globe to see how people are adapting to a changing climate. More at mos.org. And WellPoint. With WellPoint's health plans, members can visit any specialist with no referrals or primary care doctor required. WellPoint. Your whole health is our whole point. WellPoint.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library. Jim Browdy, Marjorie Egan, streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. We are back again on Friday. Phil Lang is kind enough to join us for an hour. He's the general manager of the T to take our questions and most importantly, yours from riders and would-be riders. And we're not here next Tuesday because of some marathon cleanup. And then we'll be back on Wednesday with the Attorney General, Andrea Campbell, from 1 to 2. If you're just tuning in, our conversation was inspired by reading that Matt Lauer, former host of the Today Show, credibly accused of sexual harassment, sexual abuse, even rape, once back in uh, to the media. And he not only once back in, but he wants an apology. I think most of us think uh, he should not be back in. And he should be the one who figures out to apologize to others, which is not nearly enough. But I want to say one thing before we get back to the calls and you, Marjorie, at 877-301-897. I wish I'd thought of this uh, while Al was on the phone. I didn't until the break. He's talking about how we need good male role models, the Ted Lassos of the world. Who's the highest profile role model that we have in this country? Uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump. And yeah. so the one might assume that the trickle-down effect of somebody being abusive and wildly disrespectful to women uh, 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 does trickle down to particularly young people who well, are aware of what he has gotten away with, if not even if not celebrated for his, uh, his behavior. There are a lot of guys on uh, Facebook and, and on social media that take guy that are definite misogynists. They have- Well, he's, uh, yeah. But they have millions of followers. Yeah, they do. So, I mean, what are we, what are we to make a, of that? But I wanna, I wanna mention this, uh, you know, this piece in The Guardian, how famous men toppled by Me Too plot their comebacks. And this PR guy is talking about how one of the first things stars do is try to get a so-called spin doctor or a, a PR guy. And this person says, uh, his name is Andrew Blum, he says women should have a say, the women that were uh, abused or Obviously. harassed should have a say about whether these men uh, will come back, what they can do when they come back. Um, but eventually he said some of these men may have something to add, uh, but the likelihood of rehabilitating a reputation depends on the severity, obviously, of the offense. But he says, I love this part, in some cases, this is, uh, this is a different guy, the advice would be, you need a reality to check. There's not going to be a comeback. This is from another PR guy, Evan Nerman, who says he would advise some prospective clients who just go away and enjoy their wealth on a beach somewhere because it's all over. And uh, I think that's, I'm with that. that's pretty good. Let's go to Nicole in Rhode Island. You're next on Boston Public Radio. Thank you much for calling. Hi, Nicole. Hi, Jim and Marjorie. Can you hear me? We yep. can. Thank you much for calling. Okay, wonderful. I think, firstly, I would just like to address that society, not just men, feel as though they should have unfettered access towards 
women's bodies, to be able to comment on women's bodies. Marjorie, love you. But, um, you know, society does not feel like it has that ability and access to do to men. And what we've seen lately is when you tell men, hey, you can't just tell women to smile, um, why would they be angry about that? Why is there a difference in this access we feel like we should have to women that we don't feel like we should have to men? What's your answer to the question, Nicole? I'm sorry, say that to me What's again. What's your answer to your own question? I, I think we need to address that first because the behavior isn't going to get any better until we acknowledge the fact that historically we have felt access to women's sexuality, towards their kindness, towards their work. It's, Toward their, it's, towards their reproduction? Well, look at what's happening with abortion. Arizona, yeah. Yeah. Nicole, we're Although losing it. Thank say, you for the call. We I, appreciate I, I, it. I got to say, I, th- I, I am an equal, uh, equal opportunity. I come in a lot of men's. You do. Uh, you do. <laughs> so across the board. I mean, if somebody is really handsome, I can't resist. But you're an outlier. I think Nicole makes a very good point, though, about the, obviously the clear double standard. Don't you think? Well, I think women are just as much interested in, in men's bodies as men are interested in No, but they don't feel bodies, they have... But they don't have the ownership. How many they women have, have said what Donald Trump said, getting off that bus with, what's his name, that Bush kid? Yeah, n- uh, nobody, nobody, nobody. 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 Billy Bush, thank you. Nobody, but I... And, and it's obvious, but I'll point it out anyway, that if men across America were facing uh, near death before they could get medical help for a... We're going to play this clip from a woman who had a miscarriage mm-hmm. and couldn't get help with that miscarriage. Mm-hmm. And what they do when you have a miscarriage is a DNC, which is the mm-hmm. same thing as an abortion, but she couldn't get that DNC until she almost died from sepsis, and she may not be able to have children because the infection was mm-hmm. so bad. Can you imagine men, if we said, well, you know, we, ha- we have to wait till you're close to death before we can intervene and, and help you I mean, that would never, ever happen in America. So that's the most blatant example we have. Bob in the car, thank you for calling. Hello, Bob. Hey, guys. Um, Yeah, so I'll just start by saying, well, I'm hearing an echo of myself, but I guess I'll ignore it. You're fine on this end. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. It's okay. If you have have multiple accusers, uh, absolutely, you know, if you then, you know, maybe you should be doing jail time like Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby, right? But... The the one I want to focus on is Woody Allen. Mm -hmm. He has one accuser. Now, it's a very, very serious accusation, as you guys well know, but he has denied it vehemently. He was never charged for a crime. I won't get into the details because most people are familiar with it. And yet he got totally roped in to this whole Me Too movement to the point where he lost this very lucrative deal with Amazon Prime, most major stars will not work with him anymore, and he can only make movies overseas. He can't make movies in the Yeah, he anymore. actually... But, He's one but, of the greatest but, filmmakers of yeah. all time. Yeah. And, and by the way, can I say one last sure, thing? Sure, of course you can. You know who I blame for this? You know who I blame for this? And uh, sorry, because I know he's beloved, is Ronan Farrow more than anybody. Well, Ronan Farrow uh, uh, obviously strongly believes it's Dylan Farrow, uh, uh, right? Is that? The, is it, yes. Yeah, Dylan, who's the accuser, right. the daughter. A couple of things. Uh, Woody Allen just made his 50th film in France, I guess, making your point. He has to make them overseas. He's the penalty, for lack of a better expression, has been voluntarily exacted by distributors who don't want to distribute his films. They've made their decision. Uh, actors who don't want to play in his films anymore, but there are obviously some who are fine working with him. So where's the injustice if people, based upon the facts as they saw them, made their judgment as to whether or not he was a guilty party? Some said no, some said yes, and that's the end of the story. He isn't facing criminal prosecution. What's troubling about that, Bob? Well, what's, what, yes, what's troubling about it, and I would love to have you guys address it, isn't one accuser different than multiple accusers? Of course it is, but, yes. they, but the notion that, with all due respect, Bob, the notion that one accuser is not enough, is, which is what seems, you seem to be saying, is uh, a real problem. Because then the message is, if you're a male who wants to abuse uh, women, just make sure you do it when nobody else is around. So, of course, 
it's better to have, uh, well, it's not better to have more victims, it's better to have more witnesses, but uh, your underlying point, Bob, is one that I don't find compelling, but we do appreciate your call. Thank you. But you know you. what we should point out, though? Manhattan, uh, the Woody Allen film that was about his having a romance oh, as course. a 40-something-year-old man with a high school kid. Margot Hemingway? It was a Hemingway kid, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. M Mariel Hemingway. Mariel, sorry. Yeah, it was in 1979. Yeah. Were we all appalled as you went to the theater to, to watch that movie? No, no we thought it was one we of his not. best films. So, so, I mean, we were way, way behind on this, too. We put up with a lot of uh, this kind of stuff and thought that's the way it is. And everyone remembers that when the kids started complaining about the priests in the Catholic Church, what do we say around here? They're making it up to make money from the Catholic Church. So we, we don't believe sexual abusers um, still today and look at people that vote Don for Donald Trump probably don't believe the women, all those 24 of them that have accused him, including E. Jean Carroll. They mm -hmm. probably think she's Sadly, I money. think you're right. Anyway, coming up after a quick break, we're going to talk with NBC Sports Boston's Trenny Casey. Uh, we're going to get her takes on March Madness, Red Sox opening day, and this really weird thing that's happening with these college bat uh, basketball players and other sports players, now that people are betting on these games, if the players uh, ruin the, the bettors' uh, spread or cause them to lose money in the game, <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting attacked on their phones. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We're broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News. Every headline. The House has passed $245 million for the state's shelter system. Is a human story. 783 families on the wait list. So those are 783 families that are really looking to contribute to our Commonwealth. We have the job openings. We have the spaces for, for these people. And it's really important that we continue to welcome them and to remember that these are individuals. GBH News with NPR. What matters to you? Support for GBH comes from you and Safety Insurance, offering auto insurance policies designed to help for when the worst happens. You can ask an independent agent about safety insurance. Safety Insurance, we'll help you manage life's storms. And Atlantic Design Center by Eldridge Lumber and Hardware, committed to helping you achieve your vision for a new kitchen or bathroom and guiding you from design to completion with showrooms in York and Portland, Maine. AtlanticDesignCTR.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie are live at the Boston Public Library, streaming online at youtube.com slash gbhnews. We're back here on Friday, 11 to 12. The GM of the T, Philip Eng, joins us to take your questions. Uh, again, 11 to 12 on Friday. Before we introduce our next guest, Marjorie, it is somebody pretty important in our lives' birthday oh, today. You're aware yes. of that? Who would that be? John Parker. John Parker. Happy, Happy birthday. Happy birthday, John Parker. We love, love, love one of the kindest, John most talented men Claw. we have ever met in our lives. Parker. John Parker. Many, many, many more. We are so lucky to have you as a colleague. We're joined and friend. We're joined now by Trenny Casey. We're pretty lucky to have her around too. Anchor reporter Yay. for NBC Sports Boston. And a BPR contributor. Hello there, Trenny. Hi, guys. It's not hey. like to say I'm an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> so, There's so, an honest woman. So, uh, Trenny, th the women had huge ratings in March Madness, in some cases crushing the men. Not in some cases. Absolutely crushing the men in the f for the finals. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, the women's final between South Carolina and Iowa, which was a magnificent game. It was such a fun watch. Caitlin Clark scored like 18 points in the first quarter. Iowa got out to this big lead, but you knew South Carolina was going to come back. They were undefeated for a reason. So the overall ratings, the ratings came out uh, the day after, like the overnight ratings, and then um, that was 18.7 million. But then the official ratings came out yesterday. 18.9 million wow. people watched the women's national title game on Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock compared to the men's game. Uh, between UConn and Purdue, which had about 14 and a half million. So about 4 That's million huge. more people watched the women's final than the men's final. So can I ask you the question we've asked you now three weeks in a row, 
and see if we get a different answer. Will it, will it carry will it, over? Will it carry over? I mean, Caitlin Clark, is, there were a lot, Marjorie and I are talking about all the great women players. I mean, we could both name a half a dozen who were brilliant, but Caitlin Clark, Clark was the yeah. superstar who got everybody engaged. So this is why, and this is a case I made Monday on my show, um, or Tuesday, I think, after the national mm. title game. Um, on, on our Bella Early Edition, the case that I made for this lasting is that, you know, because people have said, oh, well, you've had Sue Bird and Diana Taurasi and Rebecca Lobo, like um, Shamika Holdsclaw, uh, Brianna Griner, like you've had all of these, Brittany Griner, excuse me, you've had all of these unbelievable basketball players and talented basketball players before who have then gone on to the NBA, uh, WNBA, and it hasn't had the same trickle down effect. And I said, the one difference though, is that these women, the Caitlin Clarks, the Juju Watkins, the Angel Reese's, Flo J. Johnson, uh, Cameron Brink from, um, from Stanford. First of all, there's a number of people I can mention there. There's not just one name in Caitlin Clark, though she was the biggest, but they aren't just on the basketball court. You are seeing them in yeah. advertisements. That's a very good point. So you're seeing them point. in the same way, like, you know, how, you know, how, Patrick Mahomes, he becomes a household name, one, because he's so good at football, but two, because every time you turn on the TV, there whether it's is, a State yeah. Farm commercial or a Gatorade commercial or Nike or New Balance or whatever it is, Adidas, there is their face That's and their name. Point, and, yeah. and now with name, image, and likeness, which is why I'm such a fan of the NIL rule, is it really helps boost, I think, a lot of women's sports, in particular women's basketball. And I think people tuned in and were like, oh, this isn't, this isn't just okay, like, this is a great product, and in some cases, it's better than the men's product. I think where they're gonna have a little bit, I, I think the men's college pro product has this issue as well. Like, can you name, like, other than Zach Eady from Purdue, can you name somebody from men's, from the men's double N no. NCAA tournament? Clingin. No. Right, oh, right, Donovan right. Klingman, the center for Connecticut. For Connecticut. Oh, yeah. Donovan Klingman, the 7-2 center for, okay, so those two guys and they were in the finals. Right. Like, I could name a bunch off Marquette because I'm a Marquette fan, but like, I don't watch, I'm not gonna watch a lot of men's college basketball during the regular season any more than I'm probably gonna watch a women's game, but if there's a star to watch, and if next year I find out that, you know, if, if you know, Juju Watkins stays at USC and Flage Johnson stays at LSU and they've got a big game and a big matchup, I might tune in just to watch those players when I don't know who's coming up for the men's team because they're one and done. That's and then, a big deal so too. I think that that is going to help draw interest already, too. If you're, I don't know if you guys saw these stories that have sort of trickled in, um, but we, somebody at our office, I think it was um, Adam Hart, happened to look at um, WNBA ticket prices for like a regular game and then a game where Caitlin Clark is coming. And the ticket prices are, are you mean like for this three, next season. For this next season. She's, she's going to be with the, Indiana. She's gonna, right? Yeah, she's going to go to Indiana. Yeah. Um, she's going to be the, she's the prohibitive no, number one overall pick. So what's happening in the like, ticket It's price? like 90 bucks for a regular game and 350 when Is she that really plays. True? So oh people, my gosh. It's, it's already, and again, I think. Part of any, the popularity of any sport, and this is also an argument I made the other day on my show, is that it takes time. And I know it's frustrating as a woman because we're so far behind, right? Like, think about it. The Boston Marathon is taking place on Monday. Was it Bobby Gibb, who was the first woman? Yeah, we've had her on the show. She's yeah. the first woman to run, and she had to run incognito. No, she was. Oh, she was. That's yes. right. Yes, and Kathy yeah, right, yeah. Schroeder or something. Ka no, Switzer. 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 I think Kathleen. Oh, it was Kathleen Switzer? I think who was like pushed Pull out. Off. That yes, yeah, so that yeah. like finally got a number the year later. Like we're talking about, and what that was in the '60s, if I. The late '60s. Late '60s, early '70s. Yeah. So we're talking what 40, 50 years ago, and they didn't even think women could run 26.2 miles because they thought it would hurt hurt their body. So at, if you look at some of the other professional sports that are wildly popular now, in particular the NFL and NBA, it took those leagues decades to become popular the way they are now. The NFL started in 1920. They didn't have their first Super Bowl until 1967. The, the NBA started in the 1940s. It didn't really become popular until the 1970s. It takes some time yeah, you, for anything, I think, to be yeah, as, as popular as, like, it, it doesn't happen overnight. And Bobby, she, she's a great sculptor now. Remember we saw some of her yeah. stuff? Let me just say, the one difference is I want to believe what you're saying, because I loved it, by the way. I was, I loved it. We were even talking about the coaches. I mean, really. Yeah. The, the thing that uh, I think distinguishes maybe what you're talking about, women in individual sports, tennis, running, uh, skating, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, have been 
pretty popular for a while. Oh, right. yeah, for a yeah, while yeah. now. Absolutely. It's team sport. Can you think of it? Uh, is there another? Oh, the well, I would the soccer say teams. Women's I guess soccer. In Olympics yeah, like the, US, the U.S. women's national you're right. team. Yeah, you're right. um, I, listen. If the product is good, people will watch. Yeah, right. But that's and the other think, thing. And is how when you look at these women's teams now, you just go, "Oh my God, these women are unbelievable." The dribbling, the ball handling, the passing—I mean, they're just great. And of course, Clark, as everybody said, you were like your jaws on the floor watching her hit those three pointers from like what three feet beyond the, the, the circle arc, yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. I, so I think that's got a lot to do with it too, because they didn't used to look like this. Well, I also, I don't think you got your best athletes. One, for a long time, women weren't seen as being like when I even when I was in high school and I graduated from high school in 1995 so it wasn't even you know be 30 years next year my goodness um but i didn't i didn't want to be an athlete i wanted to be a cheerleader, cheerleader. or a pom-pom girl yeah. because that's like when you turn when you watched girl. a movie and that's what i was i was captain of my <laughs> pom-pom squad when you watched a movie the cool kids were cheerleaders, were cheerleaders yeah. and dancers they weren't athletes now the cool kids are athletes like a lot of my friends who have young girls were talking about how they were so enthralled and they wanted to go out and play basketball after this what's happened with soccer Soccer. Since 1999 and Brandy Chastain, soccer has exploded among women. So what happens then is you get your best athletes going, going into, into those sports. sports. Yeah. Just like in men's sports. Like you know, baseball is on the decline because your best athletes now go into basketball and football where the money is. They don't go into soccer. It's why soccer isn't big in the United States when it's big internationally. It's all about the talent and the athletes and the stars. And if they have that, then they have the momentum to become just as big as any men's sport. Okay. I think. So let's talk about the other end of the spectrum, which is so depressing. There's this story in The Athletic oh, about how uh, uh, people, because of gambling, which I think now is legal in 38 states in D.C. or something like that. Let me read you some of the uh, texts or tweets, I guess, that uh, players who played at the end of a game, usually people on benches, who blew the spread, meaning someone bet that uh, X University was going to win by 25 points, right. and this bench warmer came in and hit a three-pointer, and they only won by 24 points. Uh, here's this. You're a son of a bee. Hope you enjoy selling cars for the rest of your life. That's nothing. I hope you effing die. Kill yourself for taking that three, you effing worthless loser. Slit your effing throat, and on and on and on yeah. like that. What do you do about this? I mean, they've talked, uh, Charlie Baker I mean, actually has talked about urging Congress and state legislatures to outlaw certain kinds of bets. Yeah. But this kind of bet about who wins and is yeah, unavoidable. And mention that Zach Eady guy, he said he gets them all. Oh, yeah, he's Zach Eady, right. Yeah. Career, big star. Well, yeah. Gabby Marshall um, said that, and this, and this is the parallel I'm going to draw. This has been happening. It just hasn't happened in time. Like tied to gambling, like guys who make, miss kicks for teams, miss a uh, a field goal for a football team, get death threats all the time. You know, people who miss a game-winning shot get death threats all the time. People are psycho on Twitter. Like they are not. Like I always try to tell people it's, and I try to tell young people this, and I sound like Mike Felger. Get off the internet. Get off the internet. You do not need to be on all of these social media platforms. I, I suppose now it is used as, as a tool of, a, you, you can monetize it. But the people who comment, you can limit who comments on your stuff. You can limit who sees your stuff. Like these people have been lurking. Now they just have one more thing to complain about. And I do agree. I think it's. I think it is great that Massachusetts doesn't allow prop bets. Which Explain are, what a prop so bet is. So prop bet would be like, um, like I was reading a, 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 a preview. I think of the Iowa, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Iowa LSU game. And it was like a kind of a betting preview. And the, the guy who wrote it was like, oh, you should definitely bet on Flaget Johnson. She's um, like plus 250 to score two, like 15 and a half points. I couldn't bet on that in Massachusetts because I was betting on an individual player. So I couldn't bet her to score more than 15 and a half points. So Massachusetts even though I doesn't won, allow prop bets they don't in like, college? They do not allow prop bets in college. That. That's good. Uh, that's great. Uh, Massachusetts doesn't allow prop bets on Several college. Several other states don't either. And they don't allow you to bet on your own team. And listen, I'm not saying that this is right in any way, but it doesn't, people, those gross, disgusting humans who are like basement dwellers are everywhere. And it doesn't matter what happens in a game, whether you're college. I mean, this happens to high school kids, right? Like high school kids get trolled online if they don't win a game I for know. like the sad guy who hasn't, no offense if you've never left your hometown. I'm sure your hometown's great. <laughs> but like, if you're still wrapped up in like your high school football team's outcome, like you're a loser, like <laughs> knock it off. And these are kids, leave Bruce them alone. Bruce Springsteen wrote a song about that. Yeah. yeah. He did. Glory days? Glory days. I love Glory days. days. I'm getting we used to sing that college karaoke all the time. Everybody sign their name. 
You have to sign it's, your name. Yeah, it's Wouldn't just. That'd be great. Well, that's what Dan Kennedy did I with know. on Media Nation with his comments. It reduced the numbers, but it obviously decreased the. Uh, the, venality. Yeah, exactly. Can we go and, to, and people don't want to participate in that. Okay, it's opening day yesterday. And I was, as I was telling Marjorie, I was on my phone with one of my many doctors as I was driving <laughs> to work this morning. And he was at opening day with his wife. I won't say his name because I didn't get his permission. Nice day. And as beautiful as it was that they not only honored uh, um, uh, uh, Tim, Wakefield Tim Wakefield and Stacy Wakefield, his wife, who both died of cancer in a very short period of time. Larry Lukino And he as was well. not only a great pitcher, but he and she both deeply involved in the community yeah. in really serious ways. Larry Lucchino, former president of the team who just died. They bring back the team that broke the curse yes. 20 years ago in yes. 2004, except for Kurt Schilling, who uh, refused to come, which I think was wise. And uh, I'm told, uh, what's his name? Derek Lowe was very... Der what did he do? Oh, well, Derek Lowe is a, is a pitcher on that, uh, that 04 come? team. You know, he came and he was asked and he was very candid about uh, how they felt about Kurt Schilling not coming. And he said he thought it was in his best interest that he didn't come, that it would take away. He said, but more importantly, as the night went on, I couldn't, uh, they basically they couldn't guarantee that somebody wouldn't punch him in the face. Well, by the way, did. the issue was, yeah. that, that was, the issue was not his racism yeah. or his, no. his pronoun. All of his other it was that he outed, he outed the cancer. Yes. Of Tim and Stacey Wakefield, Wakefield had ready. kept their cancer diagnoses, both both of them, quiet. Um, they have a, uh, two ch children who are in their late teens, early 20s, Bri uh, Brianna and Trevor. Brianna, yeah. Um, she threw out the first pitch. She threw out the first pitch, and they had asked everyone who knew, and everyone knew they were sick, but they asked them to keep it to themselves, and then Kurt Schilling, the lowest of the low, went on his podcast oh. and told everybody that they were sick, yeah. and then Tim Wakefield like, died three days later. You know, but the thing that this doctor of mine said, and I, I, I assume he was there, is they had 40 players, roughly, from that incredible team that, quote, broke the curse after 86 years. He said they never introduced the players by name, the individuals. Is that true? So I, I was taping something uh, for, uh, for air. Like, I had to tape something uh, until, like, 2.15, so I actually didn't see the entirety of the opening ceremony. That wouldn't surprise me. That's a lot of guys. Here's, uh, listen, I understand why they want to honor the 04 team it's been 20 years i question right from the start why do it on opening oh, day that's ridiculous because I agree. you're going to have everybody there on opening day anyway and then so john tomasi our really great red sox beat writer was great. there and he said it just was like a weird vibe because it was like they tried to put too much into this is like so the red sox they just can't get anything right these days it was too much in a pregame ceremony like especially after the passing of tim and stacy just honor Tim and Stacy, and now with the passing of Larry Lucchino, honor them, and then bring the 04 team back. Like you know, when it's nice outside in yeah. June for a, a you know a series against the Brewers in you know the end of May when they play Milwaukee and nobody cares about it except for me. You know, like that's that's when you should but, you do know, that. For, so at least then you can bring people to the ballpark. I know it's a lot of people, but with the exception of David Ortiz, I'm not sure I could identify. Three players. Oh, you'd, you'd remember Johnny Damon. Okay, so five of them, eight of them, whatever. But don't you think they, I mean, Derek take some Lowe, time, even, um, say their damn names. And, uh, I for, know. Do you for know both Terry, them and, Terry and their Fran fans. Terry Francona was. The manager. The, ma the manager of that squad uh, was there, but he did not, he like left. He like did all the pre-games, the pre-stuff, and then he left. He actually didn't attend the ceremony. Well, he's angry at the ownership, And nobody right? really knows, why. no one knows if it was that or if it was something else. It's just, and then the Red Sox squad, and they lose 7-1 to one to the Baltimore Orioles who are thought to be a contender to be the best team in the AL East. Um, and they announced that Trevor Story, the shortstop, is out for the season undergoing shoulder surgery. And, and Nick another Pavetta pitcher is, out is for... on the uh, injured list, yeah. the 15-day injured list, with a uh, flexor strain of his right throwing elbow. So great start for the Sox. Well, let me yeah, just say, though, the, the Wakefield thing with the, with the daughter thrown out the yeah. pitch. Yeah, I mean, if there, there wasn't a dry Jason eye. Veritek, who was the catcher, catcher on that team, yep who has been, I guess, a de facto parent, he and his wife, yes, they, to they're very these close kids, to the goes yes. out and hugs her on the mat. I mean, yeah. really, was incredibly yeah. moving. It, that it, was It moved done. even the hardest hearts in our sports yeah. department is that yesterday. So? Yeah. Who's well, the hardest heart in your sports department? Oh, my producer, Jeff Capitasso. Like, he didn't, like, he didn't even, like, uh, I love him to death, and he's, like, the best dad, and he, like, loves dogs, but man, they're just saying things like, he hates Ted Lasso. Like, who hates Ted Lasso? <laughs> <laughs> I thought the headline on your colleague John Tomasi's piece what that was, was great. Red Sox home opener wasn't just disastrous it hints at disasters to come oh they're so. <laughs> they're gonna be so bad i mean it's just it's, it's somebody said today i think i was i think i was watching the early sports shows and they said mark april 10th or april 9th 2024 is the day the red sox died hey, 
let's let's talk about Lucchino for a minute. And of course, people know he was part of the the trio with John Warner and John Henry. Um, things, Tom Warner. Tom Warner. Tom Warner. John Warner sorry. Henry. Yes. Did things seem to go south more after he left? It seems like. Yes. So, in what, large part because he was someone who wasn't afraid of John Henry. Yeah. And I think now other people like he would say to him, "No, we have to. We have to sign this guy. We have to bring this guy in. We have to do this improvement. We have to, you know, make this roster move. It, it might cost us now, but it's going to have long-term positive ramifications." And really, since he stepped away in 2015, sure they won. They did win, of course, the World Series in 2018. Um, but since then, they've had a lot of last place finishes. I'm trying to think. I think they were last place in 20, three out of four. Three out of four um, years they've been in last place, um, possibly four out of five by the time this year ends. Um, Did so, you, yeah, I didn't know we were going to talk about Lucchino, but two things I'll note. We have Nancy Gertner, Judge Gertner, with us on Monday. Yeah. They were cl quite close. Oh, really? And they went to Yale Law School together with the Clintons. And uh, we should talk to Judge Gertner yeah. a little bit, Lucchino, too. But I don't know if either of you read this beautiful column by a son of a guy who worked at Fenway, I think on the grounds or something. I think I read this. He got, he got cancer. I'm gonna get this mostly right. It was in the Globe a couple of days ago. Uh, if anybody knows the story and I'm a little bit off, please correct me, but the gist of it I have right. He gets cancer. The family can't afford to take him to the facility that is most able to treat it. As a last ditch effort, he writes an email. He writes a letter to Larry Lucchino, who I don't think he knew, except that he was the leader right. of the Red Sox. This is when he was still with the Red Sox. And Lucchino, I assume most of you know, had cancer three times, very yep. involved, Dana Farber, all that sort of stuff. He gets, and I believe he got a phone call right after Lucchino got the letter. He talked to uh, Lucchino for about 30 minutes. Lucchino provided personal, a private plane for his father to fly to the hospital wow. and get treatment, and in the subsequent months and years, would always check in with his mother, the wife, to see how she was doing, to see how the father was doing while wow. he was alive. Wow. Just one of these, even though he was seen as a really hard-edged, yeah. no compromise kind of guy, which is one of the reasons I guess he won, there was a side to him that is really doesn't get spoken about much, which is pretty beautiful, actually. I'll have to find that out. I did it's not see that. in the Globe that. two or three days ago. Okay. It was really great. That. Yeah. great. Well, I told you this story about going to the Red Sox game. Oh, tell this got, story. This yeah, is great. We get tickets from, from Mike Barnacle, who had the best yeah. seats going. And we're the sitting, best. The, we're sitting down there in the owner's box. My kids were, you know, it was, it was great. And this other family's down there, too. And I'm thinking, wow. You know, we were ch chatting it up. And, and they asked how we got there. And I told them. And I asked how they got there. And they told me that they were up in the very back. And uh, they were sitting this there with the great. kids, and Larry Lucchino comes by, and they're talking, and he says, yeah, 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 it's the first time my son's ever been to, to Fenway. And Lucchino says, here, gives him his owner's box tickets and sends them down to the front, and they, and they were in the owner's box for their first time at the Red Sox, which is really nice. That's amazing. I also used to see him at church looking oh. like a homeless person. I think he went there in disguise so people would know he was Larry Lucchino. I also think that like really rich people are really rich because they don't spend money on frivolous things like super fancy clothes. Yeah, well, he, he came in there looking like, you know, you wouldn't really talk to him, but, it, you know, a couple of days beard and stuff like yeah. that, so. Jamie anyway. found the piece. The piece was written by this guy, Chris Breen, B-R-E-E-N. He's from Danvers in the Globe. The headline was the day Larry Lucchino picked up the phone and offered his uh, help. I mean, it's a beautiful story. Chris Breen, B-R-E-E-N, check it out. I mean, everyone who crossed paths with him, and, and I really didn't, except for in very um, you know, general sort of Same like group situations, yeah. um, had, had said he was, he was a tough nut to crack, and he stood his ground, but he was always respectful of people, and he, everything he did had a motive behind it, and that was success for not just the franchise, but everybody that worked for him. So. It's good to see you there, Trini you Casey. Thank Take you very care. much. Thanks Thanks for for Monday? Psyched for Monday? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you running You're this running? year? No. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> We've been speaking with Trini Casey, anchor reporter for NBC Sports Boston and a Boston Public Radio contributor. Up next, after the new news, we're going to speak with national security expert Juliet Kayyem about Arizona Supreme Court outlawing basically all abortions in Arizona, about the latest on uh, President Biden and Gaza, and of course about Juliet's piece in the Atlantic about the potential for Trump-endorsed violence if he loses this election uh, cycle and how our government might be at risk and what we should do about it. You are listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GPH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming on youtube.com slash GBH news.
It's not over yet. More smart conversation about community issues is up ahead with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan on Boston Public Radio, right after a news update from NPR. Stay with us here on GBH 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Comcast Business, committed to keeping businesses up and running with Comcast Business Internet, with internet speeds up to 10 gigs available. Comcast Business, powering possibilities. Raptors rule the sky, but what makes these feathered top guns so special? Watch these magnificent birds of prey on the next nature and catch raptors a fistful of daggers tonight at 8 on GBH2. I'm Abdul Nasir from Dorchester, and you and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you. I'm Jim Browdy, head on Boston Public Radio, live from the Boston Public Library. A day after Donald Trump said that abortion should be left to the states, one state, Arizona, went back to 1864 and a law that bans virtually all abortions. We'll talk to Juliet Kayyem about the impact. Then behavioral scientist Michael Norton has a new book about the power of rituals to improve our lives. We'll talk about relationship rituals in particular, then bring you into the conversation. I'm Marjorie Egan. Then it's GBH News Higher Ed reporter Kirk Carapesa and the Heckinger Report's John Marcus on the new season of their podcast, College Uncovered. Everything you need to know to avoid financial ruin just to get a degree. Plus, naturalist Cy Montgomery on this summer's cicada infestation, why some indigenous leaders are trying to grant whales legal personhood, and how the animals of Hancock, New Hampshire, responded to the eclipse. All that and more ahead, Boston Public Radio, 89.7, GBH, live from the Boston Public Library. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. President Biden's hosting Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of Japan, one of the United States' closest allies. The alliance between Japan and the United States is the cornerstone of peace, security, prosperity in the, in the Indo-Pacific and around the world. But Biden's come out against Japan's Nippon Steel's $15 billion bid to acquire U.S. steel. The deal is raising concerns about economic ties between the allies. The Labor Department says that consumer inflation is running higher than expected in the United States. The consumer price index rose four-tenths of a percent in March over what it was in February. NPR's Rafael Nam reports that could keep the Federal Reserve from cutting interest rates for now. Consumer prices rose 3.5 percent in March from a year ago. That was hotter than expected, and it's likely to have major implications for the Fed. The Fed had made clear it will not cut rates until it can see evidence inflation is easing more substantially. The central bank had previously projected it could cut rates three times this year. That may change now, given inflation is proving to be hotter than expected. The timing of any rate cuts is also very much up in the air. All in all, the data shows we'll have to live with higher inflation and higher interest rates for a little longer. Rafael Nam, NPR News. A new court ruling may intensify a push in Arizona to put a measure for greater abortion protections before voters in November. Yesterday, the Arizona Supreme Court ruled that an 1864 near total abortion ban on the books for the state is enforceable. Jimena Bustillo reports a decision has prompted criticism from state officials from both parties. The long-awaited ruling by the state's highest court has brought back a 19th century abortion ban that provides exceptions for the procedure only to protect the life of the mother. The ruling is raising concerns from both Democrats and Republicans, including GOP Senate candidate Carrie Lake, who praised the 1864 law two years ago while running for governor. Advocates for reproductive rights say Arizona voters should be able to weigh in on the matter. They are pushing a ballot initiative that would expand abortion access and enshrine the right to an abortion in the state constitution. Backers of the initiative have already gathered enough signatures to place the issue on the November ballot. Jimena Bustillo, NPR News. In Manhattan, former Trump Organization Chief Financial Officer Alan Weisselberg has been sentenced to five months in jail for perjury. He pleaded guilty last month to lying under oath during testimony in a lawsuit against former President Donald Trump. The 76-year-old Weisselberg was led away in handcuffs to serve out his sentence. He also served less than four months in jail last year for dodging taxes on $1.7 million in company perks. You're listening to NPR News. 
Good afternoon. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. The Rentham School Committee is abandoning a, abandoning a proposal to ban teachers from displaying pride flags and other LGBTQ plus material in the district. Community members turned out in force to condemn the idea at last night's school committee meeting. Committee member Paul Lashway, who has, had introduced the plan, he agreed to withdraw it in the face of pushback from residents and parents, but he defended his intentions. This policy was simply stating employees should not promote personal views on sensitive topics. So to suggest this was going to compromise human rights, to suggest this was going to compromise inclusivity, safety, is a wild mischaracterization. Like many districts, the Rentham schools already have a policy that prohibits teachers from engaging in direct political advocacy while on the job. The Mayflower 2 is set to embark from the Mystic Seaport back to Plymouth this morning. If weather and water conditions cooperate, the ship would have left at 10.30 this morning, and we have good word that it did. It'll travel nonstop through the Cape Cod Canal for around 20 to 25 hours, arriving at the State Pier at Pilgrim Memorial State Park in Plymouth sometime tomorrow. Should be going through the canal in the very early hours of tomorrow for anyone hoping to catch a glimpse of the tall ship during the the journey. Her progress can be tracked on the Mayflower 2's website. In sports, Red Sox Baltimore play game two of their three game series tonight at Fenway. First pitch 710. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Schwab with Schwab investing themes like artificial intelligence, renewable energy, or pet passion. Over 40 themes to invest in. Learn more at schwab.com and the Doris Duke Foundation. It's your Friday. I am Marjorie Egan. Welcome to our number two of Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting live at the Boston Public Library, streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. Friday, uh, we're going to be joined by the T's general manager, Philip Eng. He's going to be here from 11 to noon to take your questions and ours here at the Boston Public Library. Uh, we are not here next Tuesday, but we'll be back on Wednesday. I'm going to get it right this time, Jim. It's going to be Axe, the Attorney General, and Drea Campbell is going to be with us from 1 to 2. And we got a special show. We do. May 3rd, mm-hmm. live from UMass Boston. And we're going to be joined that day by Governor Maura Healy. Mm-hmm. So very exciting, Jim. Next Here's a quiz days. for you, Marjorie. Mm-hmm. Can members of the public go to UMass Boston yes. to see our yes. show? Yes. Excellent answer. Yes, that they is the can. correct answer. Yeah, we're very excited about And by that the way, too. the former head, the chancellor there, the newly installed chancellor is going to join us. That former head of the GP, uh, EPA, Gina McCarthy, who we are very fond of, will join us too. We're joined now at the desk by national security expert Juliette Kayyem. She's former assistant secretary for Homeland Security under President Obama, faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her latest book is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age. Age of disasters. Hello, Juliet. Hello. Hey there. Hello, Juliet. Thank Hi, you. Um, thank you very much for coming in. So, uh, Juliet, the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, yes. uh, makes his much awaited pronouncement about what he thinks about abortion these days. He's been dancing around a 15 week, 16 week national ban. He says in fed, a federal ban, and he, now he says we should leave it up to the states. And the day after he said, leave it up to the states, one of those states, Arizona, decides that they're basically the Supreme Court there, they're basically going to outlaw abortion. So um, how is this going to play? Oh, uh, so, well, politically, I I don't think it's good for Republicans, just given where the vast majority of the American public is, at least with with, uh, uh, access to, to abortions, even with some restrictions. But what's happening in Florida, Arizona, uh, and uh, and uh, Alabama is the natural result of Dobbs, which is, you know, if you leave it to the states, the states are going to have very, very odd, antiquated ways to think about it. And they're run by state, a lot of them are run by state legislatures who are, uh, who are very conservative, which is not consistent with where the American public is. So it's just like, I mean, this is just proof of I mean, sort of what does it mean? What's Trump trying to do? It's just proof Trump does not believe in anything. Can he doesn't he, believe in anything. I saw, uh, I, there's, you know, there's... Only there's one all, person doesn't believe that he believes in anything? Oh. I mean, he doesn't believe Seven. in anything. Okay, I fine. mean, like, oh, what's his, what's his, what does he think about abortion? You think this guy has any core beliefs? I mean, he, I mean, we know that. 
One of the things that's interesting is the Republicans who used to talk about choice, pro-choice or pro-life as I a moral it. issue yeah. are now talking about it as a political <laughs> issue, which you're like, okay, did you not, like, were you in your own never-never land about how you thought this would, uh, would unfold? The other hilarious thing is, um, as I'm looking behind you, is uh, you know, people from like very we have sound from others oh, who are just trying make... to backpedal yeah. from what was the natural extension of of Dobbs, so, um, and, you know, I've, I often think like, you know, reproductive freedom is, is reproductive safety. It is about, you know, women not dying in Walmart parking lots because they have to wait to bleed out before a doctor will see them. Okay, so well, let's talk about Carrie Lake for a minute. Yes. Carrie Lake ran for governor. When she ran for governor in 2022, she loved the 1864 law that, that bans right? abortion. We should be clear, no exceptions except life of the she mother. She called abortion Execution. Well, here's what else she had to say. This is back in 2022. That was then. We'll tell you what now is. Here's a candidate for governor. She lost. Carrie Lake. We have a great law in the books right now. If that happens, uh, we will be a state where we will not be taking the lives of our unborn anymore. Okay, that was two years ago. And as Marjorie said correctly, she called it execution, any sort of abortion. Yesterday, and this is the same person as far as I understand. Yesterday, she says Katie Hobbs, the woman who beat her for governor, has got to call the legislature in a session because this law is an abomination <laughs> and we need a common sense solution so that women have rights yeah. and we protect them and all. I mean, you know, I, we said this to John King or somebody yesterday. I understand if you change your do a 180 on a budgetary item, you can yeah. pretend. Bike well, lanes. I learned bike, bike lanes. Bike lanes, bike bike lanes is perfect. Okay, right? I it's learned, like it's I like I learned. Data. I saw the exactly. data. Like there's no moral issue. What like do you I, say? Marjorie's answer to everything I say when I say it is not possible that Republican voters no. believe this is well, they don't believe it because they watch Fox News. Everybody in Arizona, I would hazard to guess, everybody knows that Carrie Lake, who's now running for the Senate, we should have said, that Carrie Lake was in favor of this outrageous 1864 law until she was against yeah. it. How do they how do they wiggle out of this? Yeah, I, I mean, part of it is. Uh, they don't have any narrative to wiggle out of it anymore because if you say it's a state's rights things, well, look at what the states are doing. They can't support a federal ban. Um, Even though they do, they can't. They, they can't because right. they, know, they know what that's going to mean. I mean. Every swing state is just going to move. And so they have no, they have been so mean. I mean, this is just the way, they just... Like, you know, no exception for incest, no exception for rape, no exceptions for, you know, make, make women prove that they're bleeding out before. And, um, and they are now seeing the consequences of their meetings, which is just the, the law is now just reflecting what they want. And now they're realizing, oh, maybe this is a political issue. Like maybe actually I should listen to my constituents who don't want to force 14 year olds to have babies if they've been, uh, if they've been raped. Hello, Here's Ohio, we a, right. Uh, we oh, have a Ohio. clip from uh, this new uh, Biden campaign yeah. ad. Good. And this is a woman named Amanda and her husband and they're sobbing uh, because the woman had a miscarriage. Then she almost died because of an infection from that miscarriage because she couldn't get help because the doctors were worried about being yeah. prosecuted. The infection was so bad that she may not be able to get pregnant again. And here's at the end, uh, viewers see a black screen with a single phrase, Donald Trump did this. Here she is. Yeah. This is the outfit that she was gonna maybe wear home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, this is the blanket that she was in. <laughs> Her little footprints. <sighs> Hope Carrie Lake gets to watch that. Over yeah. Would well, you hear what uh, Frank Luntz, the Republican pollster, said on CNN last right. night at your station? He said, if Donald Trump is able to make this election about uh, immigration and the economy, he's the next president. If Joe Biden can make this election about abortion, Joe Biden will be yeah. re-elected. You know what the incredible thing is? I mean, which, that, would be, which would be such poetic justice if young women yeah. put Donald Trump out of... You know, I, we haven't, let me, we haven't, ahead, we haven't lost one yet. I mean, every That's time true. abortion is That's on true. the ballot, 
uh, uh, the Democrat wins and, and it will be on the ballot in Arizona. And if the Biden people play it right, it's the only thing you're going to be talking about in the swing states. You know, um, yes, I want to cry. Yesterday, I said that uh, Trump was brilliant strategically. I think it said it to John King. And then when I was watching all this abortion coverage yesterday yeah. after the high court ruling in Arizona, I realized at the same time that he's smart enough to say to Republicans, and he has, politically, quote, this is a loser for us, yeah. which is why he attempted to escape it with this, you know, let the states decide kind of thing. He can't help himself. And at the same time, he realizes it's, quote, a loser. He proudly says uh, Roe v. Wade was repealed because of I'm me. The I'm the, he says it outright yeah. in his every pronouncement. I have nominated those three justices. Without them, Roe would still be the law of the yeah. land. So he really can't resist. Uh, and well, that's, I, what, that's what happens when you have no backbone. Core. No, yeah, no, no core. core. You have no core. Like, it's like, like you're, you're, you're not, a, you, you, everything is binary, right? It's either I, I did that or I didn't do that or whatever. But he has no nuance. He has no core. He has no guiding principles. He could be pro-choice tomorrow. I mean, yeah, if, I mean literally he could thought, say, yeah. yeah, and people would just be, I'm oh. pro-bike lane. And I, that shows <laughs> that I am, you know, I'm now a biker. Okay, so. fine. We're talking to Juliet Kayan. Okay, and, and, you know, I get these texts all the time what? about how Democrats pushing abortion up to the moment of birth. That is such baloney. Yeah. That is another one yeah. of those. Um, well, wait, wait, wait. It goes worse than that. Trump in his four-minute thing the other day well, that's, said and execute the baby yeah, after, after birth. they're born. I mean, that yeah. gets to the, the violence that is becoming yeah. a, a well, sort of key part that. of that. That, is, I mean, that statement was one of 200 in that speech that I thought were just yeah. like... That is not happening. After Roe v. When we had Roe v. Wade, after Roe v. Wade... Uh, there had to be something like you were dying or, yeah. the, or the baby was dying or something like that. That's or that you were going to be septic or something yeah. like that. Uh, th that's just ridiculous. There were no, you know, nine month, 10 month abortions. But in any case, um, you know, we talked yesterday with Adam Gopnik, this mm -hmm. great writer for The New Yorker, who talked about the parallels between the rise of Adolf yeah. Hitler and the rise yeah. of Donald Trump. And they were really they were really scary in terms of you know, Republicans now supporting Trump and people in the, the news media and all that that was doing it back at Fox News Today, this other guy that owned these newspapers back then. In any case, you had a pretty scary piece <laughs> in The Atlantic about uh, our government not being ready uh, yeah. for what could happen if uh, President Trump does, as at least I hope, lose the next election. Yeah. What'd you say? So, I mean, I was, you know, I've been writing about incitement and and elections and democracy and warning of January 6th before January 6th. And I mean, I take Trump for uh, uh, his word. I don't pretend that he's joking or think no one's going to believe him. I, 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 there, his, I'll be, his campaign strategy is one is you know fluctuates between vulgarity and violence like those are the two v's so like this is his strategy for victory like is and the violence side was the one that i was just focused on for the atlantic which um which is we all are worried about donald trump winning uh i think it's just as likely if not more likely now that 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 biden will win what should we be ready for in terms of what Trump and his people, not all of them, not all voters, just the, the core violent group are likely to do in that, uh, in that period when Trump will not concede, uh, uh, President Biden is in charge of the federal apparatus and he needs to create a narrative for why he lost. And that narrative is the people, as seen out in the streets, as seen in violence, or whatever, were denied their rights. Uh, he's telling us he's going to do this. This is the thing that's what, like, he literally, if you look at what he's saying, he's saying, Biden, if Biden wins, there's going to be no uh, United States anymore. What is that saying? What is he, that, that Biden's a dictator? Okay, so we have every right to sort of violent action against him, right? He, he has Biden hogtied in, in, a, in a video on his social media page as if it's legitimate to assassinate a, a president who might, who you're calling a dictator. Um, he that video, by the way, to me at least, looks like he uh, Biden also has got a bullet shot. hole yeah. in his yeah. forehead. Yeah, and, uh, you know, immigrants are invaders, right? So the Democrats who are letting immigrants, he, he uses the word, you know, invade. Asian, like they're like they're cockroaches, right? Everyone's expendable except for Trump and his supporters. 
in the in the crazy land world, I should just say, people like me who monitor this, there's Michael Flynn has already said, if Trump loses, it's not a real loss. So we, we go to war for this. Um, the other organizations are doing the same. So we know. I mean, that's the thing. Like, we know. Like, what? we don't, I don't have to both sides this. We know uh, what will happen. And so it was just urging a, a variety of things that I was urging uh, President Biden to do now. And it's not like I'm a genius. The, action, the, the guidance comes from the January 6th report. We forget they have recommendations for the next insurrection. Some of them require Congress, but a lot of them don't. So what preparation is he doing that... I don't... I, so the, 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 the press reporting that we can get out of the White House right now is there's a lot of deflection. Like there's a lot of, oh, the state and locals will take care of it or, or whatever. Um, uh, Biden could do this strategically. He could get a Republican to join forces for what you would just call like a peaceful transition. Um, uh, you get DC in particular ready because they will focus on DC and there's lots of things that you can do in terms of organizing. You share information with state and locals. You have a lead federal agency. Uh, and for the media, um, I think the question now is not to ask, well, this is negative. Stop asking candidates whether they will accept the results of the election, because they can get out of that easily. Oh, I heard about this, and there was this. Ask every candidate, do they endorse violence if their candidate loses, or if they lose? Get them on the record, because I tell you, like reproductive rights, anti-violence polls pretty well in this country still. The, the data, people say they're going to take... Thank you. Well, we're not so bad Thank after God. all. Thank yeah. God. Yeah, so, um, so that's... By the way, for whatever it's worth, it may poll well, but in terms of whether people think it's going to happen, GBH yes, just I did was, a poll. Yeah. 62%, I think, is the number of people in Massachusetts think that violence is... Is it very likely? Uh, yeah, very likely poll? or likely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's pretty... I was, I, I was, I, I was quoting that, look... Oh, you were, the, Yeah, right, so... Yeah. so you know, part of what I do and like give people agency, like, right. I mean, in other words, there's, we don't have to sit here and worry. And so part of this is Biden, you are not just a candidate, you're a president of the United States who is in charge of the peaceful transition to the next term. Biden can announce right now, if Donald Trump wins, there will be a peaceful transition. I will do this right. Here's my transition team. Um, what is Trump saying? What are the other candidates it's saying? A great idea. What are the yeah. sen what are the senators saying? Right, because they can always get around this little thing. Like, oh, I heard about this thing. Whatever. Get every senator to answer the question. Simple. They don't have to say, I didn't read the tweet or whatever. They all get out of the other. Yeah, I was like, I didn't read that tweet. Um, do you do you support violence uh, if Donald Trump loses? By the way, one senator has spoken to this issue. He said, if he loses, I will raise my fist to the crowd oh my God. and then run as fast as I can. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that, of course, yeah. would be the Josh great Josh Hawley yeah. from yeah. Uh, yeah. Missouri. Who's, yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, and and uh, I just... Honestly, like, I'm tired of being so passive against this force that is so obviously... So obvious and can be addressed now. But it just seems like... Why are we going through this again, wondering if that's what Trump means? Trump means it. He will unleash something. You, you think he's going away? I mean, the thing that's it, he's going to be back in 2028 unless we slay this thing. <laughs> like, I'm not joking. He's going to be he's the same like, age in 2028 that Joe Biden, Biden is yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that the Republicans do not take advantage of this moment, they do not deserve to be a political party, period. Well, they didn't take advantage when they, they had the opportunity they didn't. with they the didn't. conviction they didn't. And, think, the and think how trial. different things would be if Mitch McConnell had stood up to I've him. I've long thought I, that. I mean, I've you know, the history thought, books yeah. are going to put a lot of yeah. this right on his shoulders. So tell us um, about the latest with Biden in Gaza, what's going on? Oh, I, 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 I'm like trying to figure that out. I was, as I was coming, I was like, what exactly is going on? Well, he's being like, pretty tough. Yeah, right? he's, I mean, he's, he's, he's vocally being very tough. Vocally, he's, that's uh, right. I mean, he's, he's um, it's, okay, so the one thing I want to say is Israel lied when it said that they weren't responsible for the lack of humanitarian relief in Gaza. We all knew it because the second that, that Biden actually ex exerted some pressure on them to begin to get stuff into Gaza, it's starting to, it's starting to work. Now, if Biden had only done that three months ago, tens, you know, hundreds and thousands of people would have, uh, would have lived. So part of it is put pressure on them where you can, because you probably can on the military mission. Hamas 
is now claiming it doesn't have a bunch of the hostages. I don't believe Hamas either, so I don't know what that is in terms, that's why I was looking around, like what is going on at this moment in time. But Netanyahu um, is at least getting out of some areas of Gaza. We do not know if that's to regroup for a Rafah attack or if this is the, 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 you know, some process of recalibrating the war. But Netanyahu is in a lot of trouble right now because his right white right ring coalition uh, is threatening to walk away uh, if he doesn't continue and he will lose part of his left wing co coalition if he moves forward. He... He's not losing weapons from the United not States. Losing, but that's the one thing. He's, yeah, Joe Biden yeah. says. No, there's no, it's just the most ridiculous thing in the world at this stage. I mean, it really, I mean, it's, you know, you, I read an article every two days, like Biden's really upset with Netanyahu. You've got Chuck Schumer. Like, when Israel loses Chuck Schumer, you're in trouble, Israel. Like, well, you know, I mean, also in other words, when, when uh, Elizabeth Warren, as we yeah, said, yeah, Elizabeth day or two Warren's ago, been very, says, very. I'm vocal. not giving in my legal opinion, yeah. but I believe people so, who study this believe, believe that it's a genocide. That it's a genocide. So, yeah, I thought that was. I that's mean, that's that's, that's, that's a very, her. very uh, hard word, I think, for her to say. I don't even I use it. I mean, I, you know, I, I believe it's a slaughter, and and you can. Uh, 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 pick and choose whatever words you want, but one of the so things Julia, that is, Julia, yeah. what's your political analysis of why Biden isn't being more aggressive toward Netanyahu? Why not? He clearly, uh, well, I, I actually don't know if it's political or personal. I, I, I mean, I, I actually can I can I say this here? I actually, have, and I think I said it a long time ago. Um, you know, Blinken, Secretary, you know, no, State. Secretary of State Blinken. Like I know people like you know he's great and like what. Like, he started, his first trip to Israel, he said, if people will remember this, you know, I come here as a Jewish American. No, you come here as the Secretary of State, right? And, and, it, that was, and it set a way in which American policy is directed by religion and not by yeah. humanitarian, you know, by, or, or I wouldn't even say humanitarian, just some notion of, um, of, of, um, what do you call it? Like when, when things are, you know, uh, uh, some notion of what, what war is, what a counterterrorism uh, campaign is, and proportionality, that's the word I was searching for. Um, and even Blinken yesterday had this word salad, and you're like, okay, are we criticizing Israel? Are we criticizing Hamas? They bought into a narrative early on, I think Biden is starting to get on, that you were either pro-Hamas or pro-Israel. Right. Well, I think most rational people can see Actually, I'm anti-Hamas and really don't, not anti-Israel, really don't like this, this right. strategy. And that's where most are. Biden is starting to get there. Biden has a lot of personal ties to Israel, so I don't even want to blame so you know, Chuck campaign. Schumer. Yeah, and Chuck Schumer, you know, we don't talk about this enough. Like, Israel lost Chuck Schumer. Like, how does that Oh, my God. Happen? I heard a podcast with Chuck Schumer talking about his growing up in New York, and it was just, I mean, he was like in the, his whole life was Judaism yeah. between the synagogue yeah. and between his yeah. life and his, I mean, his neighbors and yeah. the whole family. I mean, very, it, no, very... No, I mean, this, these are not easy decisions. I think, I think what you're seeing in the Jewish American politics is much more dynamic than, uh, than I think is being reported. Let's just put it that way. I think it's a much, I think, I think you have a generation of kids that are sort of, you know, beginning to identify with Judaism outside of, of everything that Israel does is good. You know, I think it's, it's going to be a very, very interesting time to see sort of what, what, um, uh, the American Jewish community here, but more importantly, um, how does, I don't trust Netanyahu. I think he's, I think he's a horrible human being. He'll continue this war. Well, because he knows he's gone the second the thing is over. He's going to continue all, the war. What's the incentive? Yeah. There's no incentive, right? He loses his coalition when the war is over um, and he's out and possibly in jail. You know, the so two his things... incentive, like people always talk about the hostages. Like, well, what about the hostages? Like, why are, like, yeah, what about the hostages, Netanyahu? Like, anyway. Well, number one, I want to say, speaking of the hostages, and I mentioned this repeatedly, uh, I was chastened a bit uh, by those wonderful people we had in the studio last week who had a sister who was a hostage yeah. for 54 days, Yarden, who was released, and a sister-in-law and a cousin, I guess, once removed, who's still being held. 
And uh, every time we talk about this, we do have to yeah. mention the importance of the hostages. The other story that I can't Can shake... Can I just say one thing on the... Well, let me yeah. just say one thing here. The other, I mentioned this the other day. As horrible as it is that so many kids... Uh, I shouldn't say as horrible. It, it, it is unimaginably horrible that 10, 12, 13,000 kids, Palestinian kids, are dead. When I read the story the other day in the Times or the Washington Post, and I should have known this in advance, that even if they deal with this famine at these, this point... These young kids are so physically damaged yeah. that the rest of yeah. their lives... Not to mention yeah. the organ, well, beyond, that the organ just, degradation will so never get yeah. back to normal. It that is it is, it but is. you were going to say, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Netanyahu is also starting to lose the hostages' families. So, I well, mean, they're demonstrating. I mean, they're demonstra the the, these demonstrations, which aren't getting reported wildly now, or widely as much as... They, these demonstrations are, remember, all, there were all those demonstrations before October, before the Hamas attack. Around the attack, judiciary reform. Around yeah. the judiciary reform. reform. Then, then there was a detente. Yeah. These are uh, uh, very big um, uh, uh, protests. And I just think, I mean, I think you have to be living in a never-never land at this stage in U.S. politics to not, uh, to not understand that something has to change. And it's nothing about... Judaism or Israel's right to existence or Zionism. And a lot of our editorialists, a lot of the columnists, a lot of the commentators on TV are like, you know, still in October. And you're yeah. like, yeah, you, you, you know, that, that was horrible. And six months later, a, a lot of damage has been done by that. Now, unfortunately, Julie. we have no time, so we're going to have to wait till next week to talk about how Jared Kushner is making billions of dollars. <laughs> Trading off his connections yeah. to foreign governments Saudis. because of his it's time in the White House. Leaving Hunter Biden in the dust. I, mean, I know. It is. But I mean, it, it, it is so inconceivable how. Billions. 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 Yeah. Billions. And, and the other thing is, is that you know there's no audit of that money. So it doesn't seem so, you know, like a. You know, he'll it's, take something, a it's some huge proportion of his whole business is coming from Qatar one, yeah. and United Arab Emirates. 99%. Yeah. Yeah. Is 99%. From the Gulf nations. Jeez. Yeah. Well, you okay. know, he's a Middle East expert. He's he a Middle East expert, exactly. that's right. Nice to see you, anyway, Julia. We'll Bye, Bye, guys. See you She's later. Thank you all. Assistant Secretary of Homeland Security under President Barack Obama, faculty chair of the Homeland Security Program at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Her latest book and my favorite title ever is The Devil Never Sleeps, Learning to Live in an Age of Disasters, which, of course, is what we're all doing. Up next, an old friend Polish of the show, living. we haven't seen him in ages, is behavioral scientist Michael Norton. He is back because he's got a great new book called The Ritual Effect. How important rituals may be to our peace of mind, even our success. We're listening to, you are listening rather, I'm here, to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, we'll break down the two budget plans coming out today, one from the Massachusetts House and the other from Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Brentham schools are dropping a proposed ban on the pride flag after community pushback. And we'll discuss a ballot question that could require Massachusetts employers to pay all service workers, including those who get tips, the same minimum wage. Those stories in all the day's news, starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and Babson College. Students can gain the know-how to become a successful leader at the number one graduate school in entrepreneurship, ranked by U.S. News and World Report. Virtual Open House, April 17th. Babson.edu slash grad open house. And the Boston Speakers Series, announcing its upcoming season at Symphony Hall for seven evenings, including Andrew Lloyd Webber, Liz Cheney, former NATO Commander Admiral James Stavridis, and Supreme Court Correspondent Nina Totenberg. BostonSpeakers.org. <laughs> Welcome back to Boston Public Radio, Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We are live at the Boston Public Library, streaming online at youtube.com slash GBH News. Reminder, Friday, 11 to 12, in person here, Phil Lang, the courageous general manager of the T, courageous because he's going to take your questions about T service and your concerns about the future. Next Tuesday, we're back here. Next Wednesday, the Attorney General joins us at uh, the library from 1 to 2. We're joined now at the desk by Michael Norton. Michael is a behavioral economist. He's the Harold M. Brearley Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. Most importantly, 
I believe he's wearing the exact same shirt as he was wearing <laughs> last night when I was with him at the Cambridge Public Library. Is that correct, Bob? Yeah. yeah, I came straight here. Okay. Yeah. So, did, his, so did Jim. He's been his, in the same <laughs> shirt for about two months now. His two latest years. book, which is spectacular, is called The Ritual Effect, From Habit to Ritual, Harness the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. We're going to talk to Michael about his book for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to invite you to call in about relationship rituals. Michael, congratulations. It's great to see you. Yeah, you we so really much. missed you. Yeah, it's great to be back. Just, just because you were writing a book doesn't mean you couldn't be talking about us the issues of the day. But anyway, you're back now. Thank you very much. So <laughs> tell us what, what you were doing with this book, The Ritual Effect, From Habit to Ritual, Harnessing the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. What were you doing? I started to kind of look around the world and see that um, in so many domains of life, people were doing funny little things. I mean, I'm a behavioral economist, but I like to study the little quirky things that humans do, that I do and that other people do. And it started to seem like a lot of them had a little bit of ritual in them. We have our, our morning little routines where we have to do it in our certain order and the yes. coffee first yes. and then the paper and then the, we have our things at work, we have our things at home, we have our things in our close relationships, our family dinners. So I just kept seeing over and over again, people had these little practices that they did that really mattered to them, that often they come up with themselves. And I wanted to say, why are we doing this? Does it help us? Does it hurt us? What's going on underneath the hood? Can you do, let's go through the mundane things for a minute. What's the difference between a ritual and a habit? Habits are typically, uh, by the way, I'm not anti-habit. <laughs> I want to be very, I wish I had better habits. I <laughs> wish we all had better habits, but they're a little dry. They're a little boring. They're kind of things you need to do and check them off your list. Yeah. So They're not laden with emotion. That's what I took away. Is that a fair <coughs> description? That's one of the differences. That's okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll often ask people in, you know, in the morning, do you shower first and then brush yes. your teeth? Or do you brush your teeth and then shower? What, by the way, what do you two do? I don't take a shower in the morning. What? I take one at night. Leave the set. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a nighttime shower person. I brush my teeth first. Brush your teeth first. Yeah. And if I made you switch that at all, how would you feel? Well, I would have a hard, I would not be happy not with be happy. In all seriousness, I would not be happy. Uh -huh. I mean, you, and that's what makes it like a, a, a thing, right? If you get upset about it and it ruins your day, if you mix it up, do the toothbrush first or the shower first, it upsets you. That's exactly right. So lots yeah. of people say, what, literally, what are you talking about? I don't care what order I brush my teeth. It's just brushing my teeth. It's a habit. That's a habit. What about superstition? Now, you mentioned this musician who brought some pink lobster or something like that <laughs> with him every time he performed. Is that a superstition or is that a ritual? By the way, you can waste an entire day of your life typing in any celebrity's name, yeah. followed by the word ritual, <laughs> and you're going to get, ama not every single one, but you're going to get amazing stuff because people who perform at that level, they really bring ritual to bear before they perform. There's something about the stress of really needing to do something big that makes us actually do something okay. big beforehand. So that is a ritual, it's not a superstition. I think superstitions are kind of a, a category okay. of rituals, but so are weddings and funerals and also knocking on wood. Tell us about the pink lobster. No, you asked them a question. Tell them about, yeah, the, about pink the pink lobster. lobster. Who was this guy? Yeah, so this pianist, one of the greatest pianists in the world. You think, you know, as a pianist, you'd, you'd uh, practice your entire life. The main thing you do before you go on stage is maybe warm up your, I don't know, I don't play the piano, but warm up your fingers mm -hmm. or something like that. This person's ritual was to have a pink plastic lobster, <laughs> for real, pink plastic lobster that always had to be within us. It didn't have to be right next to him on stage, but it had to be within a certain radius of him in order for him to feel that he could perform the way that he wanted to perform. And just like if you can't brush your teeth at the same time you feel off, this is maybe a little more odd, but pink lobster isn't really any different than needing to brush your teeth at a certain time. It made him feel like he was ready to go on stage in front of thousands of people and get it done. And what's, well, I, the, wait, wait, and what's the evidence that when he did that, which made him feel ready to be on stage, that his performance benefited from his ritual? One of the things that um, we see in the research, so when you are feeling anxious about something, like a, a big meeting or a performance or whatever it might be, one of the most common things that we do is we tell ourselves in our head, just calm down. And I promise you that is the worst possible thing yeah. you could ever do to yourself because unfortunately humans aren't built like that. We can't just say, I want to feel happy and snap and we're happy. We can't just say, I want to feel calm and snap and we're calm. One of the things that rituals do is they help us actually, you know, when, when you are anxious and stressed, not only are you anxious and stressed about what you have to do, but then it starts to spiral out of control. Mm -hmm. Now you're anxious about your job and your family. You know, I mean, it just can go anywhere. Rituals help bring us not to spiral off like that 
stay enough on target that when we do them, we're, we say we're ready to go, ready to do this. Now, I love the beginning of your book, the preface where you say, uh, Flannery O'Connor, the great Catholic writer, began her day with morning prayers and thermos of coffee, shared with her mother, and then went to mass. Hugo, Victor Hugo, stripped naked and told his valet to hide his clothes until he has met his daily writing goals. I thought that was great for people that write for a living. But you also talk about one of the most famous guys that couldn't just stop was no more, Gar uh, no more Garcia Parra that used to play for the Red Sox. Tell us about his rituals, just in case people don't know. Yes, yeah, so there's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm from Rogers, I can say Noma was an amazing player, <laughs> and famous for being an amazing player, but also, if you remember, he had these, real, mainly with the batting gloves, with yeah. the undoing and doing the batting gloves, <laughs> tapping, and all that stuff. So there's this study that I love where they looked at baseball players, they videotaped them, then somebody coded how many movements they made before each pitch. Not total in the at-bat, literally before each pitch. The average was 83 <laughs> different movements, and it ranged from like 50 to 150 movements, something like that. And it's, if you think about, you know, the touching the head and the helmet and all that <laughs> kind of stuff, you can see how it starts to add up. Yeah. Nomar is for sure on the outer edge of the number of movements that people uh, would ever do when they're batting. But what's important is, and they see this in the research, is no matter whatever you do before you're ready to hit, everybody at some point gets in the batter's box and just kind of stops, and then they're ready to hit. So the problem, if Nomar kept doing the batting gloves through the hole at bat, too much, right? He just obviously right. strike out every time. So we have this sense of, I'll, I'm going to do my ritual, I'll leave enough time to do it so that when the thing starts at 8 p.m. or whatever it might be, I'll be ready to go. But what happens when the ritual starts controlling you? I mean, it, when it's too much, maybe in, I don't know if it was in the case of Garcia Barra, but in the case of anybody, that does happen too. It does for sure. I think, um, it, including with athletes, in fact, some teams have sports psychologists. If you go too far with the ritual and that can stress you out in and of itself, you know, am I doing the ritual correctly? Maybe I should start over. Maybe I should do the ritual again. You can think of something like obsessive compulsive disorder yes. as related to that, where it may start as a ritual that you're doing to calm down or, you know, you check the door, check to see the doors locked before you leave for work or for something else so that you feel good about it. But then you kind of get stuck in the checking the lock. So the ritual itself becomes what you're doing and interferes with the thing you were trying to get done. And that's when we start to say the ritual's too much now. Yes. As soon as it starts to affect your life negatively instead of positively, maybe we need to pull it back. You know, I have a dear friend that takes him about 20 minutes to get out of the house, someone has to take two steps back, two steps to the side, turn around sideways, turn around like that. It's a little out of control. It's a little out of control. Is that you? No, it's not me. Okay, just one It's not me. Before we get to the... Is it Jim? Uh, <laughs> before we get to, maybe, <laughs> before we get to uh, rituals in relationships, and that's what we're going to take your calls in in about 10 minutes at 877-301-8970. Explain one more thing, which I hadn't thought about before, but it's pretty important. There are legacy rituals that are sort of passed down through family, through culture, through whatever, and rituals you create, you or you and your partner, or whatever, create on the spot. Tell us the difference. Yeah, we, when we started studying rituals, we thought we were going to study the, we call them legacy rituals, but these are the um, ones with long tradition. They could be religious rituals. They could be thousands of years old, literally. There are things that come to us. Thanksgiving, for example, is something that kind of comes to Americans fully formed, and then we do Thanksgiving. So those are incredibly interesting and important in our lives. They play really important roles. But I got interested because I'm a weirdo. I got interested <laughs> in the ones that people make up themselves, that they, out of nowhere, spontaneously start to come up with things to help them through whatever it is that they're doing. There's in the most, often in the most mundane of circumstances, the right? Not some grand anything. It's, I mean, morning things and evening things to get to bed. They're very subtle things that people come up with. For me, the, the big insight actually was with my own daughter when uh, she was born. If you've ever had a child, what happens is the hospital says, take the human with you, and then <laughs> you've got to take care of the human forever. That's right. There's no training of any kind. Exactly. In the first, Go home. The first night is, uh, get, how do you get the thing to sleep? I mean, how do you get the all thing to sleep? <laughs> and so what, what we did, I mean, we're scientists, you know, so whatever, but what we did was we started, we, wouldn't, we didn't say let's do a ritual together, but what we started doing was, I think here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, let's read this book followed by this book, and then we'll get these two stuffed animals, and then we'll do the, the bath, and then we'll do this stuffed animal, and then we'll do this other song, and then we'll get in bed, and then we'll do, I mean, this incredibly elaborate sequence of things that we started to do. <laughs> totally unclear if it helped her sleep, by the way, but it helped us feel like we had some control over the situation. There's no ancient text that says, you know, good night moon should be read to the child after the bath. 
but every parent has something yeah. that they that they end up That's doing. That's so true. In fact, I teach um, college freshmen, and, and when they go home for the first time, often in Thanksgiving break, I ask them to ask their parents to remember what they did to help them sleep when mm. they were little, and all of them say, "My parents started crying because oh. they remember that it, and it brings you back so viscerally." to holding your, you know, we all remember our kids when they were babies, but these things bring us back in a really powerful way. You know, uh, sorry, Marjorie, go ahead. I was just going to say that is so true. I think Goodnight Moon, my kids were all grown up, but that was, a, that was a big thing. But I also love the rituals you talked about in your family with the Johnny Mathis Christmas <laughs> albums and the Three Times a Lady. You know, what was going on there? It sounds like you had a lot of rituals going on. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, as many of us are Irish Catholic, uh, so there's, there's religious rituals, but then we also have our own kind of family rituals. So every family does their rituals, and then for some reason you get these random things that get built in. And I, have, I don't know why. My, my dad had this stereo that he bought when he was in the service from Germany. It was this, it was this long kind of thing. Uh, whatever. We never used it ever. We weren't even supposed to touch it. It was too fancy. I'm one of five, so everything was ruined in the house. <laughs> so the only, the only day of the year we used this thing was on Christmas, and the only things that we planned, for some reason, I don't know who got it, we had a Johnny Mathis Christmas album. Specifically, Johnny Mathis. We, had, we also had, like, the uh, Andrews sisters and oh, stuff like God, that, of course. Yeah. But this Johnny Mathis. And so every year we would put on the Johnny Math. Ne we never listened to Johnny Mathis any other day of the year, ever. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Johnny Mathis. It just wasn't a big deal for us. But it became this thing where it's like, it's kind of quiet in the house. You know, it's Christmas, but some, what's, what's missing? And, and what if you, know, you didn't have let's it? Let's put on the Johnny Mathis. What if you didn't you have it? you got to do it. I don't know what we would do. We, maybe we'd have to talk to each other, which would be the worst thing. So. No, but I'm serious. Based upon your research, when something like that, that, that is that critical to a family and their relationship, when it's withdrawn, what happens? Yeah, we do see... I mean, one way to think about it is when families blend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you had kids from your previous marriages, and then you think of the Brady Bunch, but for real, where it's <laughs> not just right. easy. You've each got your own traditions, and then you come together in the same house, and you've got to sort out... Are we going to do yours? Yeah. Are we going to do mine? Exactly. Are we going to take both? And families really struggle with it. But one of the things they do is they often take some from one family, some from the other family, and just like my family, come up with some of their own that are theirs and that makes that family that family. You know, I have one last question. And I have before one we before get, the break, Yeah, too. before the break. Um, you, you, what did we call Max Weber? A philosopher, writer? What was he? What, what was his? I don't know. Sociologist. Something like that. Yeah, sure. But you, but you t talk about his feeling in, in your book that, um, that we have gotten away from too many of these cultural rituals and these family rituals and we're now too... I don't know, bureaucratic or something, uh, religious rituals, because nobody's going to church anymore, not very many people going to church anymore. And he thinks that's a big loss, or he thought that was a big loss. Is he right? I think um, if you think about the role of rituals, if you think of kind of the, the legacy ones that we talked about that go back hundreds or thousands of years, humans often do sometimes lose those. You know, your parents had a faith that you don't share, and so you don't do those anymore. You don't go to mass or whatever it might be. But I don't think it's the case that that means we've lost ritual in our lives or lost the emotional benefits of rituals in our lives. There's two examples always that I think of. So one is Burning Man, oh. which is not religious, yeah. except like, let's just break it down. You go on a pilgrimage to the desert. Does this sound familiar from like the Bible? Yeah. And then you gather with like-minded people yeah. and you burn a thing at the end of the That's thing. Right. You take substances that might alter how you're feeling. About. I mean, it's very ritualistic. It's not religious. But it's not that we've lost the things that rituals do for us, mm -hmm. like bring us together and things like that. It's just we use them in a new context. Okay, so before we do take a break and take calls from people about their rituals, particularly in their relationships, but any rituals you want to talk about are fine. 877-301-8970. Before the break, talk about one of the most ordinary kinds of rituals, but a hugely important one. Coffee in the morning kind of thing. And end it with your excerpt, uh, which you shared last night from This Is Us. Go ahead. Yeah, so the... Um this is the saddest thing ever. So uh, if you watch the show, This Is Us, uh, the character Miguel's trying to explain what, when he knew his marriage was over. His friend Jack asked him, when, when did you know your marriage was over? And Miguel says, every morning for years, I would make coffee and I would bring it to her in bed. You know, it was like a special thing that I always made sure to do. And he said, one morning, I just didn't feel like doing it. Oh. Which is already devastating. Oh. heartbreaking. And then he said, and the worst thing was, she didn't even notice. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Oh, my. I mean, that show made me cry like a, <laughs> insanely every single episode. But what's, I mean, it's coffee. It's the most mundane thing, technically. It's just liquid in a cup. It should not mean anything. 
But in, when you build these things into your relationships, it they does. can mean everything. Johnny Mathis doesn't mean anything necessarily, but when it gets built in to these close relationships, it's a huge signal of how things are going and how much we love each other. Okay, we're, we're talking with Michael Norton, a behavioral economist, Harold E. Brilli, professor of business administration at Harvard Business School. The book is The Ritual Effect, From Habit to Ritual, Harness the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. After a quick break, we're going to open the lines at 877-301-8970 to call or text about the, uh, the rituals you have in your life, particularly if you have those in your relationships. We hope we don't hear any tragic tales about people who stop bringing coffee to their partner. But whatever so you got sad. going on, the number is 877-301-8970 to call or text. You're listening to Boston Public Radio. This week on Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, 200 top U.S. musicians demand protections against AI. Beyonce's Cowboy Carter album blows up the record books, and Kevin Hart is crowned comedy royalty. It's our pop culture roundtable. That's Under the Radar with me, Callie Crossley, tonight at 9 here on 89.7 GBH and the GBH app. Support for our programs comes from you and Johnson & Wales University. From computer science to psychology and multiple MBA programs, JWU offers an immersive learning approach online. You can discover more at jwu.edu. And Mass General Brigham Health Plan. Innovative plans, coverage, and a broad network of doctors. Mass General Brigham Health Plan, with you every day. For more information, you can visit massgeneralbrighamhealthplan.org. I'm Zoe Matthews, senior producer for Boston Public Radio, and you and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're live at the Boston Public Live. It's streaming on live at youtube.com slash GBH News. Friday, we're back here with the general manager of the T, Philip Eng from 11 to 2. Next Tuesday, we're not here. It's sort of like a marathon hangover kind of deal, I guess. And we're back on Wednesday with the Attorney General, Andrea Campbell, from 1 to 2. We're speaking with Michael Norton, behavioral economist who works at Harvard Business School. Where, by the way, Marjorie, I'm sure you read this in the book, before a lecture, before he teaches a class, he paces in his yeah. office for 30 like minutes, hour. writes down his lesson plan on a yellow pad, always, am I right so far? Always on a yellow pad, and then puts it in a briefcase that your father gave you, and you do that every single time. So he lives what he's talking about. His latest book, which actually was on the Drudge Report yesterday. I know. My God. I was so excited when I saw it there. That's huge. Well, wait a second. What well, you should say, when I said to you last night at the Cambridge <laughs> Public Library, how great was it? that your book on day one was mentioned in the Drudge Report. What'd you say? I had no idea. He had no <laughs> idea. Okay, so take his advice. His latest book is fabulous. It's called The Ritual Effect from Habit to Ritual, Harnesses Prizing Power of Everyday Actions. And by the way, he talks about everything from holidays to mourning to dealing with death. I mean, every kind of life situation, I think it's really helpful. 877-301-897. We want to know about your rituals, particularly relationship rituals, but any ritual that matters to you. Margo in New Hampshire, you are on with Michael Norton. Thanks for calling. Hey, Margo. Hey, how are you guys? We're excellent. Fine, Thank you. Margo from Hancock. Oh, hi, Hancock. Sai's going to be on at the end of the show, hi. speaking of Hancock. Hi. I know. We already talked about it. Okay. Um, so I have two quick things. <laughs> One, um, ritual in relationship um, as a grandparent has been instrumental in, you know, kind of relationship building with my two granddaughters. Like what? So, you know, they, they well, so it's like every Friday is dinner at Mima's house and we listen to the same kind of music on the way over to my house. And we look for the, when they were little, we look for the same song. sees the firehouse sign first. And they know which things they can do once they get in the house. And just that repetition of um, things that we do every week kind of keeps us bonded, I think, in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, even if we don't see each other for a couple of weeks, we, they pick it right up again. You can hear it in your voice. What do you think of that, Michael? Then, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Margo. Sorry. 
I can hear my voice, too. Um, so, uh, anyway, um, the other thing I was going to say quickly is I, I, I had to deal with some significant trauma, and risk dealing with um, PTSD and trauma is, I think, very, very important in a healing sense. Margo, that was a great call. Say hi to Cy. Tell her we'll be talking to her at 1.30. Comment on the grandkid thing, but then we didn't touch, except in passing, on the value of rituals around death and mourning and that sort of thing, Michael Norton. Yes, I think, um, first off, I love the, that story and, and seeing the sign every time. It's, it's so funny that, again, the random things mm -hmm. that we build in that have so much meaning, and especially for kids, their worlds are often so narrow that these things are so huge for them. And so I love the, that idea. And in fact, we see... If we ask people about their family, like are you close to your family, your, not your nuclear family, but you know, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, if people say yes, the reason they say yes is because they got together for holidays. Sometimes people say, you know what, I, I don't know if I ever would have met my uncle <laughs> if it weren't for weddings and funerals and holidays. <laughs> yeah. Why would I have gone and seen my uncle or my cousins except for it? So rituals really bring family together often in a way that's powerful. By the way, a lot of people on our show call in and say, I wish I never met my uncle, <laughs> by the way. Holiday otherwise, but keep going, Michael, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I mean, I do think there's, there's just deep emotion in there mm -hmm. on, the, on the positive side. And then, and then, as you said, we also use rituals on the negative side. So sometimes we're using them to try to enhance an experience, and sometimes we're using it to try to get over something. And again, what we see, so you know, every faith, every culture has something that they do when someone passes away, a funeral or different work, you know, it lasts for a day or three days or five days mm -hmm. or a month. It varies from culture to culture. But people also then tell us that they do their own thing. One woman wrote that um, her husband had passed away and she said, I washed his car every weekend the way this. that he used to. Oh my God. Now again, there's no, I don't want to belabor it, but there's no ancient text that says <laughs> wash the car every week. That's not how it works, but you could see for her how building that ritual in was a way of honoring him as she continued to cope with grief. Listen to these two texts. My ritual every day, twice a day, was to walk my dog Jazzy around the same general loop in my neighborhood. Jazzy passed away in December. I find myself continuing the loop twice a day, helps me feel connected to her. Sweet. And then, get out your handkerchiefs. My husband likes to tuck me in when we go to bed. We have a certain way of say, we say goodnight, and if one of us goes off script, usually me, he makes us start all over again. <laughs> Bless his heart. That is fabulous. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? Roger and Marblehead, you're on with Michael Norton. Thank you for calling. Hey, Roger. Hi, good morning. Uh, or, or afternoon, Whatever it is. Hello, you're welcome. So, uh, so my ritual is uh, referring back to uh, the ancient text um, <laughs> of the United States Constitution. Uh, my ritual each morning uh, as I'm having my first cup of coffee, is to stick a dozen needles into my Trump voodoo doll. <laughs> I have the same ritual. I can't believe it. I don't even know you, Roger. It's amazing. But go ahead. Well, and then, and then I carefully prepare a cup of hemlock, and I pretend that the voodoo doll... That we're not... No, that we won't. We're not doing that. Okay. Is that it? Uh, that's it for now. That was, uh, that's it for now. That's enough for now. Thank you, Roger. We really appreciate your uh, call. 877... 301-8970. Josephine in Boston, welcome to the show. Hi. Um, Hi. My husband and I have three rituals mm -hmm. that we kind of do all the time. One is I work from home, so he buys me a cup of coffee every morning mm -hmm. at Dundee's, and mm -hmm. then we always have Friday uh, Date night. Mm-hmm. Keep going. And we always, and we always, yeah, and we always say, I love you before we go to sleep. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. Those are, I mean, Josephine, thanks. That's, there's a lot of that, right? I mean, that's pretty basic. I don't mean that in a critical way. It's yeah. wonderful, but that's basic kind of stuff, right? Except yeah, there's, there's often, there are very, very little things that come to be when you do them regularly the way you do them they become really, really important. Two of my favorite relationship rituals, one couple uh, wrote, uh, we always kiss in threes. Mm. And they said, I don't know when it started, but it would feel weird. You know, two kisses, it's like, wait, you don't love me anymore? <laughs> I thought we were a three kiss couple, you know, kind of thing. And the oh. other one, this couple said, um, every time before we eat, we clink our silverware together. And then they eat, which is so random yeah. in a sense, and yet it's kind of adorable that they decided that this is their thing that they do together every time. 
The name of the book is The Ritual Effect, From Habit to Ritual, Harness the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. The author is Michael Norton, Joan in Boston. You're on with Michael Norton. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, so in terms, of the, in terms of relationship things, I don't know how this started, but my husband and I, whoever goes into the bathroom first before bedtime, Put toothpaste on the other person. Oh, toothpaste. that is great. Oh, oh uh, my God. Great. Go ahead. And, and it's actually it's become kind of a funny thing. Um, but but I, will, I wanted to get back to when you were talking about the Christmas thing. We had, when our kids, we had three kids, and when they were very little, we were starting traditions that we didn't even know we were doing. Because when, once they got to be eight, nine, or ten, they all started saying things like, well, we always... We always put this on the tree first because that's what we always do. And Mike and I would look at each other and say, we, we do? And they're like, yeah, it's a tradition. And there were like all these things that we didn't realize we do all the time, but the kids picked up on them and it meant something to them. So then we started calling them our tradition. So sometimes they're unplanned. <laughs> How about the Thank unplanned there, uh, Michael? Uh, Joan, that was great. Thank you so much for the call. I love this with kids, too, because so when you're a kid, you know, as we all know, the holidays arrive fully formed. <laughs> yeah, like that's you just, right. You just get out of bed <laughs> and everything's all laid out yeah. for you. You really take it for granted. But also, I think you, you don't realize that your family's doing it in a certain way. Thanksgiving is just Thanksgiving. Yeah. That's how we do it. And it's, it's the case that um, if you ever, like college students might go home with, for Thanksgiving with a roommate, or if you have a significant other and you spend Thanksgiving with their family, people are horrified. Horrified. I mean, the number one emotion is it's like really... disgust and rage. Yeah. Like, what kind of a family exactly. eats at four o'clock on Thanksgiving? <laughs> and that shows you, oh my gosh, we were, we did do it a certain way. Like, yeah. we do have our own way of doing it. Yeah, and that's... these kids are clearly building in their way of doing it. This is how our family does Thanksgiving. Speaking of holiday, let me read Zoe, our colleague, just writing us a note. My family always used to go to the same farm to pick out our Christmas tree together. I didn't realize how much it was imprinted on me until I went to college. They did it without me. I cried, she said. <laughs> Let's just deal with the first half of that for a second. Going to the same place to buy the Christmas tree. Depending on what that means to you, that could be just a habit or it could be a ritual. Is that, is that right or not? It could be sort of a reflex, it's Christmas time, we go get the tree, it's so-and-so, we do it, it doesn't mean much, we just do it, or it could be elevated to something else. Is that right, or am I missing the boat? You know, that's, that's completely right, I think. I mean, even, even parents who are, cre again, creating the holidays fully formed for their kids, some parents see it as like a series of tasks to be performed, yeah. and other parents see it as, you know, creating magic and joy for their, <laughs> for their children, so the kids don't know which one's which, they just like it, but yes, for sure, couples often disagree on what are the key elements and what are we really doing here? Which reminds me of the Matt Damon Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Live bit about how much we love Christmas. If people haven't seen that. That is an absolute riot watching that thing about their rituals on Christmas. But listen to this. This is, um, uh, Jim, you'll like this one. My ritual is to listen to you two wackos every day. That's you and me, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. Despite not agreeing with almost any of your opinions so I can lose a little bit of hair every day. <laughs> and then listen to this one. My husband's family is religious. He grew up saying grace before dinner. I used to roll my eyes at it. Now that I value family dinners with our 11, 9, and 2, 6-year-olds, I've grown to love the value of a brief, brief moment in time when we pause to appreciate each other in our meal, even if it's not about God. It's a ritual of just being grateful. How about that? You want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, these are just such nice examples because you, as a family, you might want to start dinner in a certain way. We try to say something we're grateful for. With, with our daughter, and it, whether it's religious or not, you're kind of sharing values with your family, and you're saying, this is what we care about, this is important to us. Can you solve a problem I broached with you last night when we did this thing at the Cambridge Public Library? Marjorie would, uh, I think, corroborate this. Every time we're approaching a holiday and we take calls about how you're preparing, mm -hmm. half the people call and say, well, my uncle is for Trump, we can't be together, and when he does come, it's a disaster, or my ex, my fiance, whatever. And I, I reference, remember the, speaking of SNL, the great routine, where uh, a, a family gets together for Thanksgiving, and as soon as something grossly offensive is pl uh, said, they start playing Adele's song yeah. "Hello" and they start singing. <laughs> yes, yes, so yes. So, give us—we never have a solution for that for people. Is there a ritual solution to that incredible tension? Is there a way to diffuse it with rituals around a holiday? I'm going to say right up front that uh, the answer is no. But <laughs> I have some thoughts, which is one of the things that rituals help us with around the holidays is, n no joke, literally, 
giving us things to do. Mm -hmm. And often yeah. it's different people do different things. You know, those two people do the pies, these two people do the tree, these other people do this. And ideally what you have is you have all these rituals going on and all these steps going on, and before you know it, the whole thing's over, and you didn't have time to chat and argue. So <laughs> I think there's, there's something Keep them busy. to it. Exactly. Literally just occupy you so that you can't start screaming at each other. We'll try that. Okay, you have more text? I have one more. Sure. My husband makes me sleepy tea every night. Last summer, I kind of got sick of the tea. He was crushed. As soon as it got cool again, I resumed and will probably never stop because it's important for him. That's Maria in Wakefield. Isn't that nice? By the way, I can't stop thinking about that this is us. That's one of the most painful couple of happenings like I've ever heard yeah. in my life. Let's go to Andrea on the Pike. You're on with Michael Norton from Harvard Business School, the writer of The Ritual Effect. Hey. How are you? Great. I, um, I can't tell you how absolutely it's um, these rituals and habits are in my life because I'm in the midst of a move. And so my whole world has been like turned upside down. I can't walk my, I don't have the time to walk my dog and listen to NPR in the morning. I don't have time to eat dinner at a reasonable hour. I don't have time to go grocery shopping at my favorite market basket. I have all these little things that I do. I don't think I'm OCD yet. But it's unbelievable. My sleep patterns are way off. Everything has been turned upside down because I can't do these little tasks at the places and at the times that I'm used to. And it's really having an effect, and I can't wait to close on my house on Friday to get those back. How about wow. Michael Norton? Stick around, Andrea. I have uh, this, this belief that um, we're, we're so quick to build in little rituals and traditions in our environment that if you ask people what is the pizza place that has the best pizza in the world? In the world, it's almost always a place that's within like a quarter mile of where they live. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because that's right. You moved to a new city and you went there the first night and you were stressed that it was a new place and you went there. And what got imprinted on you was, wow, what a great, wonderful restaurant this was our first night here. And then for the rest of your life, your family comes into town, you take them to this place. You know what I mean? You never get off of this place. And on the one hand, maybe you should try another place. But on the other hand, what a wonderful emotional tradition that you have, it, a bit randomly in a sense, and yet built into it is a lot of meaning. So what do you say to Andrea though? I, w I mean, my advice, knowing nothing, is if you don't have time for any of them, pick one of that long list and try to at least honor that one. Is that a decent advice or I think, no? I think that's a great idea. And also just be, be thinking flexibly in this new environment. Who am I gonna be? What, what are the things I'm gonna start doing every day? Can't wait till you close, Andrea. Good uh, luck to you. 877, well, the lines are full. 877-301-897, uh, you can text. Mike in Boston is concerned. He and his wife have no rituals. Is their relationship doomed? <sighs> <laughs> okay, Mike, you better get one uh, fast. So, <laughs> by the way, they may have rituals and not even know it, right? Very often that's the case, actually, that you are doing something, but uh -huh. it didn't quite key in that it's a ritual. But, but I will say, we do see, if we ask couples, do you have a relationship ritual? Couples that say yes report being more satisfied with their relationship than couples who really? say no. Now, we don't know, and you raised this last night, Jim, yeah. we don't know if couples who love each other a ton just come up with rituals because they love being together. But we do see that if we ask people about their past relationships that ended in breakups, they say, well, I didn't have any rituals with that person. Oh, and, wow. and we don't know if that's because they didn't or because they say, I didn't do anything. That's the worst person in the world. There's no way I had any <laughs> rituals with them at all. But there is some signal, I think, in it, a little bit at least, if we have these clinking forks, clinking silverware or not. So tell the story. Speaking of that, just reminded me, a wonderful woman last night who listens to the show, Marjorie, was just divorced. Well, I don't know just divorced. She's divorced. And she asked you a question about divorcees. And you talked about, let's call them carryover rituals. That's not your term. It's mine. T tell that story. I think it's a, uh, it, we have rituals in so many domains of life to help us with lots of problems but we don't actually have culturally a ritual around divorce. Oh. We don't have any, it's not like, there's no ceremony where we get together and our friends and family support us. You know, it just happens. Your friends might take you out for coffee or something like that. And it's, and it's a shame because it's an incredibly difficult day. I mean, it's a long process, but the day of mm -hmm. very bad. is very, very emotional and very hard. And we don't have anything in place to help people through that. So that's, this woman was saying, why don't we have anything like this, you know, culturally to help us through this? And, and we don't, but there are, people come up with stuff just like they always do. And one of them uh, was a, I don't know what I say, I still don't know how to say, divorce, divorcery? No. Divorce. 
anniversary, something like yeah. that. An oh, anniversary yeah, the of the anniversary. divorce. Oh, yeah. Yeah. really? Yeah. So every year they get together with all their friends and they celebrate it. But my favorite one was this couple that got, uh, they had been divorced, and then they, 20 years later they got remarried oh, to each other. I love those stories. And the invitations that they sent out said, um, we're so sorry, but the divorce didn't work out. <laughs> But That's there's terrific. one more story connected to that. How about the person who in the subsequent relationship... Go ahead, tell that story. This is... So when you break up with somebody, I'm sorry if you have, probably we all have, you have uh, the things that you did together that were special. You know, you called each other Schmooper Bear. <laughs> and that was just who you were together. And when you break up, you know, your ex is... Al they're allowed to... You might not like it, but they're allowed to date other people and even get married and have a family and all this stuff. But they are not allowed to reuse your rituals <laughs> with the next person. People are so, you know, if we're Schmooper Bear in my next relationship, you overhear me saying Schmooper Bear. I mean, the rage is prof like clinking the silverware. If I caught my ex clinking the silverware with a new person, people really are so offended by that. And you can see why, because it was literally, it was us. And now you're saying maybe it wasn't that important to us. I get it. Oh, Don't totally. You? Absolutely. It. You know, we have. To, uh, let's take one more quick call, and then I have one last question for you. Elizabeth Where, from Rhode Island. Thank you for calling. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello, hello. I am so excited to say this, <laughs> um, and it sounds like a weird thing, but some rituals are. But my husband and I love the Prince of Pride. Oh. And so ever since we got married, whenever one of us leaves the house, we always say, "Have fun storming the castle." <laughs> And so, because that's, of course, a line from the yes, Prince of Pride. Yes, And now we're, we've been married for 15 years. We've got kids. And even since they were real little, when somebody leaves the house or now when we drop them off at school, we always say, have fun storming the castle. So it's our family's little weird thing, but it brings us joy. And you're not going to let the J6 hostages, as they're called, uh, dampen that uh, <laughs> ritual. Correct, Elizabeth? <laughs> Exactly. Hey, no. uh, uh, Elizabeth, thank you. You know, before you go, uh, we're talking to Michael Norton, whose great new book just came out a couple of days ago, yesterday, the yesterday? day before? Yeah. yeah. The Ritual Effect from Habit to Ritual Harness uh, the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. What I do to uh, stay calm as I listen to music, I heard this uh, of a favorite band. They're called The Lights. And I'm watching The Lights the other day, and there's a guy in the band that looks amazing. Have you ever heard the band? Have you ever heard them? No, no. So I'm reading his book. And he drops in there. Talk about, I don't know if this is one of those, what's up with brag things called? Whatever humble, the, humble brag. Humble brag yeah. kind of thing. You just drop in there. By the way, I'm with a couple of my colleagues. And it exists. You're in a band? I'm in a band. Of business school professors? Well, that makes it doesn't, not as cool as the first part. <laughs> exactly. I mean, a band sounded cool and you ruined it with a business school Do you professor. play anywhere or what? We do sometimes, yeah. You can go uh, the lights band. I if did. If you want to check us out, yeah. I did. The lights, look how these whole attitude has changed. The whole thing is <laughs> okay. different. I have got so many great texts. I, Read I, a few. I, we have a couple. Can I, can I just say, if I were talented in music, I wouldn't be standing here right now. I'd be playing music. <laughs> Thank just you to very warn much. you of yeah, the okay. level of skill. Read a few. Well, Allie in New Hampshire makes a great point. This is one of the reasons COVID was so hard. It stripped us of so many rituals without warning, and we have to rebuild them all. Yeah. And listen to this from Well, it Math helped create a lot of rituals because people need... Is that not correct? That's, That's right. Still, yeah. Listen to this from Matthew in Medford. Every work morning, right before I leave for work, I go back upstairs and kiss my sleeping wife goodbye. I linger for a moment and take in her scent to oh remember her during the day, a favorite moment. Oh my God. Wow. We get a lot of happily no, keep, married Read the are, rest of that text. It's also beautiful. What's the rest? Then he says, I do the same thing with a girlfriend, which is really <laughs> incredibly... <laughs> it's moving. I mean, he's sort of... Okay. It's in Michael's book, I think there's some. Do you have any more of those? Rituals are very common in second families, actually. That's uh, yeah. the research. Is. Yes, exactly. Uh, we've got a lot of very happy couples that have texted in, but I can't read That's them beautiful. All. Yeah. I think really those are beautiful. I know. It's Michael, very, your very book nice. is spectacular. Really, we hope people buy it. And it's great to see you as always. Come back soon, please. Michael Norton. Thank you very much, Michael great Norton. That was both. terrific. And great congratulations on a great book. We've been speaking with Michael Norton, behavioral economist, the Harold M. Brearley Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. I don't know. I think Harvard Business School is pretty cool. I think I'd be doing pretty well in life if I went to Harvard Business School myself. Anyway, his latest book is The Ritual Effect from Habit to Ritual, Harness the Surprising Power of Everyday Actions. You will see yourself in a lot of these stories and people you know. Up next, uh, we're going to be talking to... Where are we going next? Oh, we're talking to uh, Kirk and John. Our colleagues, well, Kirk is our colleague anyway. Kirk Carapesa has a wonderful podcast um, about.
college. He does it with his friend, John Marcus. It's from the Herkinger. I'm reading this wrong. I'm goofing this up. The point is, you got a great two guys coming up next. They're coming talking up. about this podcast. It's going to help you avoid the pitfalls of going broke trying to pay for a college education. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. I'm Arun Roth. Coming up on GBH's All Things Considered, we'll break down the two budget plans coming out today, one from the Massachusetts House and the other from Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. Brentham schools are dropping a proposed ban on the pride flag after community pushback. And we'll discuss a ballot question that could require Massachusetts employers to pay all service workers, including those who get tips, the same minimum wage. Those stories in all the day's news, starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. Support for GBH comes from you. And Revision Energy. Sunbug Solar is now part of Revision Energy, a solar installer committed to being a renewable energy partner for New England and working to fight climate change. Learn more at sunbugsolar.com. And Bionova Scientific, a biologics CDMO providing development and GMP manufacturing services to small and mid-sized biopharmaceutical companies. Bionova Scientific, where concept becomes cure. Bionovascientific.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie Egan. We're live at the Boston Public Library. Streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Friday, we're back here with the general manager of the T, 11 to 12, for Ask the GM. We're not here Tuesday because I don't know why we're not here Tuesday. Something to do with the marathon. We're back on Wednesday. Andrea Campbell joins us, the attorney general, for an hour to take questions. And we have a special show on May 3rd, live from UMass Boston. The governor's going to join us. Former EPA administrator Gina McCarthy, the new, newly installed, even though he's been there for a while, chancellor of UMass Boston, et cetera, et cetera. One other thing, uh, Jamie wrote me a note. Cy Montgomery, who's going to be our final guest today, was listening to the show. She has animal rituals oh, that great. she's going to share with us in the next segment. So getting into college is hard enough. Why does it feel like you need to already have, I don't know, an economics degree to decipher financial aid forms? Season two of College Uncovered, a podcast from GBH and the Heckinger Report, hosted by Kirk Carapez and John Marcus, gets in all the ways so many colleges make their prices appear much lower than they actually are, and they offer kinds of tips to get a better deal. Kirk is the managing editor and correspondent for higher education at GBH News. John Marcus, who we've known forever, is the higher education editor for the Heckinger Report. John and Kirk, congratulations. Season two is great so far. Thanks Thank you. for seeing you. Yeah, so I listened to season one and learned a lot about the scams, getting into college, and scams involving early acceptance mm-hmm. and all these things I had no idea about. Now in season two, the scamming continues <laughs> big time, and it's terribly relevant because we're reading these stories in the Globe about private universities around here costing 90 grand a year, and the Times got a story about so, some colleges are going to soon charge $100,000 a year. But Kirk, a lot of this is just, like I said, a scam by some of these colleges. So tell us. Right, these financial aid offers. So after you get your admissions offer, um, you know, you spent so hard, you work so hard to get into college, and the next notification you get is that financial aid offer. And it kind of takes you from the high, you know, of getting into college to the low of figuring out, how am I going to pay for this? And these offer letters have become so confusing and so convoluted that, as you suggested, Jim, you know, even the experts don't know how to translate these things. It's like deciphering a foreign language, right? And you can't compare costs from institution to institution. So what we're trying to do in this season, in the first few episodes, is really kind of pull back the ivy here and explain how this works and why colleges are making this so confusing. And you, in this, uh, you're, we've only heard the first couple of episodes so far, you're uh, relatively kind by saying sometimes they're misstatements, but other times they're outright lies from some of these colleges around financial aid thing. They may say things like, uh, you'll need to pay zero uh, when zero is not even close to what you're going to be obligated to. Why is there not, I know this is a moronic question, why isn't there a law that requires them, as you make a point regularly in your thing, like a mortgage? You get a mortgage, it's a 400-page thing with every nickel detailed forever. Why doesn't the same thing apply to colleges? Given the amount of money that we spend as consumers and as taxpayers on higher education, there's almost zero transparency or accountability. It's staggering. If you look at 
at other industries and the amount of money that they're subsidized by the federal government, higher education is way, way up there. Why? Every congressional district has a college in it. And they have been, they have had such a light touch in terms of regulation on these universities and colleges. 13 years ago, they proposed, the, um, the Department of Education proposed a voluntary sort of consistent financial aid offer. Voluntary. So, so that you could compare. Yeah. Um, and almost no one took them up on it. So whether they are lying or being perp at least purposely misleading, colleges make it really hard for you to compare an offer from one institution to another. You know what the best example? One of you says, I think I have the number in my head, that instead of using the word loan, which most people understand means you gotta pay it back in all likelihood, there, what is it, 136 different right. terms, Kirk? Yeah, a Fill researcher, in the blanks there, go ahead. Right, a researcher at the, at, uh, the Think Tank New America looked into this, um, and she, she basically canvassed 1,000 colleges and found 11,000 financial aid offer letters, and she found that they used 136 different terms for federal direct unsubsidized loan. Now, that's the most common loan that undergraduates take out. They used 136 different terms, things like D, sub, or uh, federal unsubsidized, um, and in some cases, I think in two dozen cases, she found that they didn't even use the word loan at all. They want families to think that they're not going to take out loans. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, by the way, speaking with Kirk Carapaz and John Marcus in the, in the podcast is College Uncovered. It's done by GBH and the Heckinger Report. So I learned so much, and it's so upsetting. You could go to college and think you're going to get X your freshman year, and you might get it. Mm -hmm. But then you don't get it your sophomore year or your junior year. Or you could get a scholarship from the Rotary Club, which you have to spend hours writing uh, you know, an essay for and have to go to get the money from the Rotary Club. And then the college can subtract the Rotary Club scholarship. I mean, talk about these, these tricks of the trade. Not only are they, are they j just sort of dumbfounding that universities would do this to people, universities which like to present themselves as being concerned about the student. Yeah. And, uh, and particularly having diversity among the student body, they don't care. They want bodies and seats. But by doing this, they make it hard for a family to understand what, what they're going to have to pay. They, they don't tell you the cost. It's the, one of the most expensive purchases that you make in your life, and you don't know how much it will cost you. And you have to sign up without knowing what it will cost. So people show up in their, in their freshman year and don't get a bill that they didn't expect, they drop out. That's incredibly self-defeating for universities and colleges because what that means is that they then have to go and replace that student, which is very expensive. So it's very short-sighted. Um, it's self-inflicted. The other thing, as you mentioned, that they do is they typically will lower the amount of financial aid they give you if you come back as a sophomore because they figure, what are you going to do, transfer? And, yeah. um, and, in, and people do transfer or they drop out. And the third thing that they do is called scholarship displacement. Several states have now banned this practice. Have no we? Notably, of course not. Notably not Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, they will, if you get a scholarship from, a private scholarship from the Rotary Club or the Chamber of Commerce, they deduct that amount from the institutional financial aid that you thought you were getting from them. So you thought- By the way, stop there. It's like they are getting the scholarship. I mean, that is essentially what it yeah. is. They're taking the scholarship from the Rotary Club or the Chamber or the City of Cambridge, and, whatever the and, hell it is. And their argument is, we have a finite amount of financial aid. If you're already getting some money from someone else, we're going to take your, our money back and give it to a, a person that needs it. But nobody expects that when they get that outside scholarship, and so they end up again having to borrow more. They don't, they don't know what the bill is going to be. By and the way, can I just say one thing here? At the end of episode two, I'm sort of screaming, tell us what to do. And you make clear that later in season two, you're going to give us lots of information, already provide some links to be the best consumer. But what is really, I thought the most useful thing you guys said in your first two episodes of season two, so that the mindset is different. You said something like, colleges are businesses, that a goal of which is to get the most money possible from the customer. Right. And you know, most of us put, you know, we understand a mortgage, that's a business transaction. We understand whatever it is, is a business transaction. Most people, I remember back to those thrilling days of yesteryear, don't see the college experience as expensive as it is as a business thing, but that is the mindset you have to enter this with, right. Kurt. And, the, yes? the, and there's so much focus on, on brand name schools and the sticker prices, right? Those $90,000 headlines, mm -hmm. you know, that we're seeing now, but it's so important to remember that very few people pay ninety thousand dollars a year, right? Very few people are paying that. The average, you know, what the average discount rate now is at private colleges? Half. 
50, 60%, yeah. or 60%. Mm -hmm. Other schools, 70%. During yeah. the pandemic, they were throwing discount rates, you know, 75, 80% just to get people in the door. And so free iPads. Right, free yeah. iPads. They, yeah. Most schools want you, right? But they've sold us this message that we're lucky <laughs> to be there. And I think with this podcast, what we're trying to do is give you, the consumer, the listener, the information that you need to make smart decisions and focus on things like affordability, outcomes, right? It's not just about the brand name and slapping that bumper sticker on the, the back of your SUV. But let me, let me disagree with your own analysis, your own podcast. I, the one of the takeaways that I got from what I heard is there are some colleges that really don't give a damn whether you come or not because mm -hmm. there's somebody else that's like a fungible kind of thing. But you guys say, at the, I think at the end of episode two, Believe it or not, you can actually negotiate with the schools. Right. And the schools with which you're most likely to be able to negotiate are people, schools that really do want you and probably do need you, unlike a Harvard. Yes, John Marcus? Yes, absolutely. And that's a lot of schools right now. So when we talk about the sticker price, the price you see on the website, yeah. there are, uh, how many was it, Kirk? 400 and some odd schools. Right. I looked it up. Where not a single student pays that price. Is that true? And, and that's the, the situation that we're in now. Now, they've... These universities have trapped themselves in this discount rate formula. Um, they are hesitant to lower the price because in America we don't think that it's, it's, it's a good product if the price is lower than the other guy charges. <laughs> So, um, it's called uh, the, the Chivas Regal effect. Yeah. The, <laughs> right? Have you heard this? Uh, no. Yeah. So basically, <laughs> American consumers were really, were, were really finicky, right? We think yeah. that just because it costs more, it must be better, right? If it's a car or if it's whiskey, yeah. and Chivas Regal was this kind of low end whiskey, yeah. and what they did was to get off the bottom shelf, they jacked up the price a is little bit, and people thought it was worth more, that and they were great. more likely to buy it. Colleges work the same way, right? If you signal that your degree is worth. $90,000 a year, or at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee, yeah, $100,000 yeah. a year, right? That signals to the consumer that this is a high-end product. And if you discount that, or we've seen, we, we cover some uh, colleges that are doing this tuition reset. We, if you drop the price, it actually signals, signals to, to the consumer that the product is inferior, that it's not as high quality. Can I stay on the negotiation thing for one minute? Because it, it really, uh, I think that's a really important lesson, even though it's intimidating. It's sort of like asking your doctor follow-up questions, which is really hard, even though you know you're supposed to do it. It would seem to me that it'd be great if there was a resource that told you, I don't know what the criterion would be, which are the schools that really need you? Maybe the ones where the acceptance rate is a hell of a lot higher. Does mm -hmm. something like that exist? So I know if I apply, I'll just pick Harvard. If I apply to Harvard and what is it, 3.4% or right. something this year, they're not gonna negotiate. Right. But Jane Doe Inc, where the acceptance rate is 38%, is probably more likely and, to do that. How do you well, find out where they well, are? Well, those schools with the low acceptance rates tend to have the largest endowments and are the most right, generous right, financial right, right. aid, right? Yeah, but right, it's the schools just below that tier. And in the next two years, we're facing this demographic cliff where yeah. the number of 18 year olds is gonna plummet because in the 2008 recession, no one was having babies and they oh. never started again. So that's why it's a cliff. It's not, it's not a, there's no bounce back. So by 2026, all these colleges are gonna be competing for a shrinking pool of students. So the other thing I, I, I was so horrified by is the fine print part that you've really, mm -hmm. John, gotta read the fine print. I mean, you mentioned that uh, in some of these schools, you gotta keep a 3.8 grade point average to keep your, your scholarship, and you may not have any idea when you're going in that that's what you're required to do. Yeah, once you get financial aid, that's, that's good, but you have to make sure that you can keep it. Mm -hmm. And so there are certain numbers of courses you have to take. There's certain grade point averages that are required. Um, there are just so many things that trip up students, and it's overly complex, like everything about higher education, unnecessarily complex. You know, a lot of these schools get money from the government, right? I don't understand why the government does not put more pressure on some of these schools not to be, because it does seem to me they are scamming people. Because they are very powerful politically. And the schools. The schools, they've managed to, they, uh, they're subsidized to the tune of about $180 billion a year by taxpayers. We're also paying for the forgiven student loan debt um, for colleges and universities that have closed, including many f private for-profit colleges whose shareholders walked away unscathed, and we're covering billions of dollars worth of, of unpaid uh, student loan debt. That's a function of the, of the surprising amount of political, very quiet political power that universities have. I think they're losing it, because I think a lot of, we talked earlier about um, people sort of regarding higher education in a different kind of way. There's suddenly a lot of attention to the return on the investment. Yeah. And universities are recognizing that and politicians are recognizing that. 
Uh, so in response to this, we talked about the voluntary financial aid offer mm -hmm. that was supposed to make it easier to compare costs. Uh, the universities have now uh, begun to uh, use their own. They have, they have on their own uh, created a coalition of universities that are uh, using a, a, a financial aid offer that's supposed to be comparable from one institution. I thought you said only one in eight are using it, didn't you say? Only that? one in eight are using it, but it, I think it's an, it's an indication that they're doing this now, and they say this uh, uh, explicitly to us in the podcast, to avoid the government coming in and making them do it. So they're recognizing that things are changing. What about merit scholarships, Kirk? Those are different than financial aid ones. That, right. What's the deal with those? Yeah, so, so when we talk about the discount rate, the 56% or 60% discount rate, they don't, call it dis they don't call it a discount. They call it a merit award, right? Because we're Americans. We love to get awards, yeah. right? We love to get scholarships. <laughs> and one thing that's interesting, kind of going back to that Chivas Regal effect, is that when the schools discount or do a tuition reset, like uh, um, LaSalle College did that recently, um, we've seen some other schools in New England, Colby Sawyer up in New Hampshire, right? We feature uh, in, in, episode, in an upcoming episode. Um, when they do that, they then take the scholarship away. So they're giving, so the, so, and families want to know what happens to my kid's scholarship, right? So they might get a merit thing, because I thought a the merit, merit thing were about maybe they didn't have enough boys and they wanted to get more boys, so they'll well, give more boys. Yeah, they're desperate yeah. for boys. They're desperate right. for boys, so they'll give the merits to the yep. boys. But if the, that boy also has a financial package, that he may lose the package if he gets the merits? Right. Award. Right. That's great. Well, the, <laughs> it, what, what they're doing in the, these tuition resets, which is a typically higher education euphemism for lowering the price, is they're lowering the price to the average. So they basically are still paying the same amount, but it doesn't say scholarship anymore, and that disappoints a lot of parents uh, who like to brag to their friends that their kid got scholarships. Yeah. Okay. So is there a pogo s part of this, too? I mean, I, I know how, I mean, I don't, my kids have been out of college for whatever, it's 10 years or something like that. Uh, and I know the FAFSA form, even redone, they totally screwed it right. up with this, well, they forgot to include inflation, you guys said, which was just unimaginably, <laughs> I mean, it just, it's almost like an SNL routine. But do parents, do families do as much as they should do? or can do no, they, to they, educate themselves? Kirk, first, yeah, they, and what so should they be well, doing? Because it's point, really and hard. Then, yeah, I understand it's, that. It's a lot of, well, they also have full-time jobs, but right? I mean, doing this is a full-time job. Wait a second, you buy a, this is like buying a house, essentially. Yeah, but you, the mortgage is, is, is not scamming you in the same way, for no, the most but my part. Po yeah, but you prepare for that, even though you get all the details. I don't think there's an excuse, and I'm not defending the people that make the forms difficult or the universities that personally try to confuse, uh, purposely try to confuse it. What more can real people be doing? I mean, it's an uphill battle, right? These form, when you get your financial aid form, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not designed for consumers. I think we explained this in the first two episodes. It's more like a marketing document, right? Yeah. It's schools trying to pitch themselves to you. So you just read the fine print, number one. Don't be afraid to negotiate. You, you know, go in there and ask and say, you know, this is really, money's tight, you know, this is really expensive, but we want our kid to get, you know, an education. Um, could you give us more? And a lot of these schools have the money. They can. They can, they can give more. They what want, do you they call want up you the there. president of the college no, call and the, say? You know, call up the financial aid office. Oh, call, okay. you know, get in there and, and, and ask these questions and really read the fine print because it's such an important investment. And despite all the skepticism about higher education and colleges, um, all the research shows 70% you know, of jobs are going to require some kind of education beyond high school in the next few years. Right? Okay. So it's so important. And right now we have this demographic cliff. It's even, our podcast is designed for you know, consumers and parents. But it's also, you know, if you're just interested in higher ed and why this is important to society and why it's so important that we figure this out, it's also for you. You know, John, getting back to the federal government, the pathetic Congress uh, doing nothing here to help people who are about to confront this, this scary but hugely important decision around their kids and the kids themselves. Didn't you say early in the podcast season, or maybe it was last season, whatever, there are some federal requirements around these things that the colleges just choose to ignore and nobody sanctions them. What are those things? The, every college has to post a net price calculator on its website. Many of them don't work, or they're showing you a price from a previous year or an inaccurate price. They have to report the total cost of attendance, which is tuition fees, room, board, and all your other expenses, including transportation. They often fudge those when they, when, when they, you know, somehow miraculously they raise tuition and all the other costs go down, which doesn't make sense, especially in an inflationary market. 
So um, they lie. So why is there no enforcement? Uh, uh, I mean, we talked last season, you talked about Varsity Blues, which I know you covered, mm -hmm. Kirk, obviously, and they should go after those people. There's no question about it. Why isn't there some sort of... Uh, we have Ayanna Presley with us tomorrow. Congressman Presley wants to talk about the uh, loan forgiveness, which does absolutely, is fabulous, but does nothing for the people who are about to start school tomorrow or next year or whatever. Uh, uh, what should they be doing here? Well, if you like the bungled rollout of the FAFSA form, that's the same agency that, that regulates higher education, and they're just, they haven't done it. And they haven't done it because the universities are as powerful as they are. Well, the, the because the universities are powerful, because there's been sort of a history of, of hands-off, because there's been a congressional kind of support for prop, uh, universities and colleges, including for-profit uh, uh, universities and colleges. Have they started saying, by the way, as I'm sitting here sort of raging against, uh, there was a great line you had from some mother calling this a financial colonoscopy, <laughs> which I love. is so, it's such a perfect description. I am guessing that maybe not in writing, colleges are going to start to defend their insane costs by saying, you know, look what the president just did. He forgave all these loans. You know, another president, four years, eight years down the line, may do the same sort of thing. And even though there's no guarantee, you, um, I shouldn't worry about that? Yeah, I don't think that colleges want to draw attention to the loans. I think one of the unintended... Oh, because they don't even call them loans. Well, they don't even call them loans, <laughs> right. and they don't want to remind us about how, how indebted we become That's to a very good college. Point. That's and a very one good of point. the unintended consequences of the Biden push for for giving student loan debt was to remind everybody how much student loan debt everybody has. Yeah, that's a very and good And that, point. I think, depressed some college going. And so what's, what's the most important thing, Kirk, we should have taken away from the first two episodes that we haven't talked about? And give us a preview of what's to come. There are nine this year, or what is it? Yeah, there's eight episodes, so eight, it's okay. all about paying for college, right? Okay. So the first season was about you know, getting into college, right. and the second season is about figuring out how to pay for it, getting through, and what you get out of it. The, the last episode is all about what you actually learn and earn when you graduate. And the research shows us we really don't know. So after all of this, <laughs> after you spend all of your time trying right. to get into college and figure out how to pay for it, in the end, like, there's very little, there's no exit exam, right, yeah. for, most, for most degrees. Um, and colleges are, are grappling with that. But the, the other episodes we're going to look at, um, we're looking at uh, junk fees, things like graduation, uh, graduation fees. Um, there's one school in New York that has a, uh, an academic, uh, academic excellence, excellence fee. fee. It's like $8,000. $8,000 um, a semester. Right. We're trying to ask very simple questions you, and then go deep on those. So, we're so wait, at, if you don't pay the academic excellence fee, you don't get excellence. You, you get but crappy, if you do, you, you get a crappy education. Education. I thought that was tuition, right? Shouldn't <laughs> tuition cover academic excellence? Yeah, you would think uh, that that was covered. Right? So we're going to ask that question. Half we're also of a looking diploma. At, what else? With, with all these schools around here, you know, we're seeing more and more schools close and merge, right, as the number of students shrinks. Is your school going to be there? Is your school going to close? It's a simple question, but this happened when Mount Ida shut down two years ago. Parents started calling me, asking me whether I knew whether the school that they were considering was going to shut down. So we, we talked to uh, um, uh, a researcher at the Clinton Christensen Institute who looks at college closures, and there are things that you can track that might tell you whether your school is at risk of shutting down or merging. Right. We'll show you how to look at this stuff. And, and to answer a question you asked earlier, the bigger takeaway is it's a buyer's market. And we've been conditioned not to think that yeah. about college. Mm -hmm. You can go really and ask helpful. for more money, and they'll give it to you because they need you. They need you more than you need them. First season was great. First two episodes of season two were terrific. Check it out. It's yeah. really great. Congratulations to you both. Thanks Thank for you. having Thanks. us. Uh, like I said before, scam artists. That's what they sound like <laughs> to misleading, me. Misleading. Misleading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Misleading. We'll put it that a nicer way. Kirk Carapaz and John Marcus, thank you very much for being here. Uh, they are the co-hosts of College Uncovered. It's a podcast great. from GBH and the Heckinger Report. Again, Kirk Carapaz and John Marcus, College Uncovered. It's a terrific podcast. And if you've got a kid about to go to college, but you really need to know this stuff. Thank you very much. Up next, we're going to be joined by naturalist Sai Montgomery. She joins us on Zoom. She's talking, going to talk about indigenous communities' attempts to save whales by seeking legal personhood for them. And she's going to comment. We talked before with Michael Norton about rituals that people have, couples have, families have. She's going to talk about rituals that animals have. Sai Montgomery's next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on The Culture Show, the Korean wave makes a splash in a new exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts. From Squid Game to Gangnam Style, fine art to fashion, 
South Korea's vast cultural influence is on display in a mix of history, K-pop, and technology. Plus, we look at the man in the mirror by way of a Michael Jackson tribute concert. That and more on The Culture Show today at 2 on 89.7 GBH. Funding for our programs comes from you. And The Lyric Stage, presenting The Drowsy Chaperone. This bubbly love letter to musical theater includes mix-ups, mayhem, and a wedding or two. Now through May 12th at Lyric Stage Boston. Tickets at lyricstage.com. And Seasons 4, the outdoor living store on Mass Ave in Lexington. Featuring over 100 styles of contemporary and traditional outdoor furniture, plus a wide selection of plants, statuary, and garden accessories. Seasons4.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and uh, Marjorie Egan. Where are we here? Oh, I know where we are. We're talking to one of our favorite guests in the mall. We're not rating them, but she is. Cy Montgomery. We're joined on Zoom by naturalist and author Cy Montgomery. Her latest book is Of Time and Turtles, Mending the World Shell by Shattered Shell. Cy, it's great to talk to you. Oh, it's great to be back. Thanks. So, Cy, we heard we were talking, as I mentioned uh, just a couple of seconds ago, with Michael Norton about his, his new book, The Ritual Effect, uh, the rituals that fa- human beings have with families, religious rituals, etc. But you said that there's a lot of rituals that animals have. Like what? Oh, this is so fascinating. I learned of this from my friend Temple Grandin. Oh, we love Temple. We had her on yeah. once. It was great. Isn't she, she's the most Amazing. genuine person. Oh, my gosh. She's so much fun. And if you want to make her laugh, just talk about anyone anywhere throwing up. <laughs> the most hilarious oh God. thing. It's a riot. <laughs> anyway, God, so Temple told me about this at... at um, farms, large farms where there's a lot of pigs and they want to make sure that when they feed them that not just one pig gets all the food. They can outfit them with these collars that have an electronic um, signal that will open a door and let the pig eat his food. Well, the pigs, of course, are very interested in what causes this. How can I, how can I affect this to cause the door to open more often? And some of them may realize that it's their collars, but others don't know this. And as they're trying to figure it out, it apparently occurs to them that last time when the door opened, I'd stomped my right trotter twice and the door opened. That must be what's causing it. Wow. So they'll adopt these superstitious behaviors, wow. just like baseball players who have to, you know, wear their lucky socks or do some special wiggle mm. before they go up to bat. And that, I just, I just love that. We are so, I mean, it, it is a good thing, I think, to be like a pig. They have, <laughs> they have such a wonderful appreciation of the sensuous savor of this world. And we all could be better people if we were more like pigs. So it's very nice that we share this with pigs. And dogs, too. I, I believe some dogs, at least, uh, do this very thing, you know, when they before they lie down, a lot of dogs will circle, circle, circle. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and an, another thing, before they poop, sometimes they line themselves up in this special position, and sometimes they circle, circle, circle. Oop, oh, got it right, and and then they can poop. And there may be other things that we don't notice that they're doing, but I think if we have an innate need to create these these rituals, you know, very few things arise in humans de novo. Um, it's probably something that we share with the rest of mammalian creation, if not all of creation. We're talking to Cy Montgomery. So Cy, we thought of you on Monday, we think of you a lot actually, because leading up to the eclipse, I think we talked to you about this too, there was a lot of discussion about what behavior non-human animals would be engaged in. And we of course became obsessed with the tortoises that have wild sex during the uh, uh, during eclipses. But did we learn anything on Monday that we didn't know before about animal reaction to eclipses? Well, to my knowledge, a lot of zoos, for example, had cameras up recording yeah, what animals were doing, yeah. and I don't think they've necessarily analyzed that yet. The thing about tortoises is they are always having wild sex. <laughs> they are having wild, loud sex. Clips or and not. Some, in the wild, that's how you find where tortoises are a lot of times. You just hear t- something going, huh, 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 huh. And it's tortoises having sex. Oh, my God. Good for them. But, you know, I... 
I did see, though, um, um, some reports about, and we read, heard this before, that some animals will run around, and they have uh, giraffes in the zoo. I think it was in Detroit. And indeed, mm. the mother and the baby giraffe were kind of galloping around the pen. And, and um, so I don't know. Do we, that's typical, I guess? Well, they know something is different, but it's very brief. You yeah. Know? It, and it, it could be, I mean, it's awful. It gets so dark. I was, I was so impressed with how strong our sun is that even with just a sliver yeah. of it showing, we actually saw the totality up in Mount Pelier. Oh, with our nice. Server. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, and it got cold, like really cold, colder than it gets when a cloud covers the sun. So animals, of course, notice that. Um, and they'll, you know, try to get to a warmer place, or if there's not enough light and they're a diurnal animal, they will want to, you know, when you can't see, that makes you vulnerable. You can't see your predators coming. You can't see, um, you know, your prey to chase it. So better to get some, somewhere else. And a lot of insects do react. But, of course, we still had all this snow all over the place up here. So there weren't a lot of insects out for us to watch. Did but Thurber I, do anything oh, particular? Um, Thurber is blind in one eye. Oh, that's um, right. So uh, the, the other eye works. We actually got him some glasses, and I sent you a picture. I think we have a picture. <laughs> We're going to post that. Of, we met oh. Thurber. There is. <laughs> I love it. By the way, Thurber is, a fa is just as great a dog as Cy uh -huh. tells us. Just a sweet, wonderful dog. Oh, yeah. he loved both of you. Yeah, we were pretty fond of him. I want you to come back. We will come back. So uh, moving beyond the eclipse, I read a story in the New York Times that a mere trillion cicadas, <laughs> actually another story said several trillion, again with a T, trillion cicadas uh, will be emerging, I guess at two spots in the country. This is sort of like an eclipse. The reason there's so many is because one has like, is it a 13 year cycle? One is right, a 17 yeah. year cycle? Yeah. And the yeah. two are sort of passing each other at the same time. So what is the consequence and should we have concern that at least <laughs> the middle of the country there are going to be trillions of cicadas there, Cy Montgomery? Um, I think we should welcome them. This is a fantastic phenomenon, just like the eclipse. The last time these two broods emerged at broods, the same right. time, Thomas Jefferson was president. Oh my so God. Are, yes, there's going to be a lot of cicadas and they, they are harmless. They are generally actually good for plants for a variety of reasons, but one is that when they die, they provide natural fertilizer. When they dig their tunnels in which they, they spend most of their lives, they aerate the soil. So they're good for us. They also are, are good food for a lot of animals like birds. So their, their arising at this time is just a really cool phenomenon. But people should be aware that sometimes you'll be under a tree with a lot of cicadas and it <laughs> seems like it is raining. And Why is that, Cy? It is happening because these, these guys drink uh, xylem. They, they drink this liquid uh, tree sap um, and they, they do it to stay cool. And they drink something like, you know, 60 times their, their body weight and that's got to go somewhere. And where it goes <laughs> is on your head. Oh, if you God. One of these trees. But it's very dilute. It won't, it won't hurt you. I wouldn't, like, look under a tree and keep your mouth open like you're catching <laughs> snowflakes. Um, and, but, but what a, I mean, what a cool thing. I remember um, I lived in Virginia during a cicada emergence. And the first time you see these, these little animals, they're big critters. Yeah. They're open. It's long. They've got bright red eyes. They have beautiful, clear wings, and they make the most otherworldly sound. I love the sound. I, I do too. Yeah. I, it's just, it is a great thing. And seldom do we in America get to see huge numbers of, of animals. I mean, it used to be the buffalo migration, which would go on for days and days, or the, the passenger pigeons. We've eradicated all of those, but we do have the cicadas emerging, how and come, this would be really exciting. And I say, let's welcome them. How there's come it's just the Midwest them. and the Southeast and not the Northeast? Why are we missing out oh, here? Oh, there's all these different broods. Okay. And we get one next year. Oh, we get one next year, okay. You know, yeah. by the way, uh, you're the last person on Earth that I would ever disagree with about uh, animal life. However, 
When you say it's not that big a deal, the urination of a cicada, maybe it's not one cicada, a trillion cicadas, <laughs> I would say, when they're drinking all this xylem. Listen to this line from the New York uh, Times story to make it even more frightening. The jets of urine, the oh, cicadas. God, Jim. It's in the New York Times, okay. Marjorie. Well, there's the, actually a story about their surprising... Um, Propulsion powers. Here it yeah. is. Oh, yes, the yes. jets of urine that you close your ears, Marjorie. The cicadas <laughs> produce, the research shows, have a velocity of up to three meters per second. The <laughs> fastest of all the animals assessed in the new work, including mammals like elephants and horses. That's right. I mean, and, and apparently, are you like, excited about that, Sire, or no? Um, <laughs> it is a pretty interesting thing. Yeah. And one reason that it might benefit us to know the speed at which cicadas can pee yeah. is that, and I read, I read in an article that this might help us design better nozzles. Nozzles, could you believe that? <laughs> yeah, that's a very, very good point. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's talk about... Do you know how many a trillion, by the way, do you know how many a what? trillion is? It's a lot. But it's don't, a lot. Don't worry about it, Jim. They're not going to be around here, so you don't have to worry about it. How fast, wait, wait, how fast, speaking of not worried about it, some of us care about our sisters and brothers in other states. Well, they're uh, not, not going to hurt you. How long are they going to stick around? Do they have long lifespan? They're or just going to be around for six weeks. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. And, and, and this, these two broods, they're going to be, oh my gosh, um... Northern Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, Wisconsin, and Iowa. So, so close to home, um, we're going to have protections for horseshoe crabs more than we have I now. I love horseshoe crabs. And you know, I, this summer walking on the beach down the Cape, I saw so many dead horseshoe crabs, and I was very upset about it. And I don't know if that's because it already been used for bait or what's going on there. But what are we doing to um, to help the horseshoe crabs? Well, this is this is really a good thing. Um, and Audubon, Mass Audubon, had a lot to do with this. Um, on March 19, the um, Mass Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission voted to ban the harvest of these animals during their spawning season. And usually, when animals are hunted, you do avoid their breeding season because that's where you make more horseshoe crabs or more deer or more whatever. So that is really, really smart. And there was huge public support for this. Um, one female can lay 80,000 yeah. eggs. So if you kill one female, you've killed 80,000 potential horseshoe crabs. And so this is a really good thing. The, the blood, um, their blood is used because it's actually, it's blue blood, it's called hemocyanin. Yeah. It's um, like octopus blood, it is, I think, copper based, which makes it blue. And it is used to it's, it's got this protein that's super sensitive to bacteria, and it's used to make sure that medical devices and vaccines and IV fluids are free of harmful bacteria. But there has been a synthetic substitute created. But what happens is the medical companies take these guys, and it's, I mean, it's so ghoulish, they take them off to a laboratory and they bleed them. Yeah. Oh. But then they let them go. But if you've, if you've exsanguinated them, they're going to die. Yeah. So, uh, there's there's some new regulations that I've, I'm pretty sure it's in Massachusetts. It's certainly, um, I'm almost certain it's in Delaware too, that um, you can't bleed as as much of their blood out as used to be, and um, that that is a really good thing. They are super important for the for the ecosystem. Their eggs feed a ton of migrating shorebirds. I think 11 species of migrating shorebirds depend on these eggs to eat. And they also, they have all these other effects. They're, they keep the, um, the sediment around coastlines from smushing down. Oh. The lovely little legs are always just digging stuff up. And one other thing I would love to share is that we think they're crabs. We call them crabs, but they're not in the crab family. They are in the spider family. Wow. So it's like the biggest spider you ever saw. They're arachnids. You know, Cy, when we first took our kids to the Cape, I, I, I will always say to them that these are prehistoric creatures. And as you're talking, I can't remember if I made it up or if it was true. Is it, they are like ancient, aren't they? Oh, 450 million years old. I was you right. Are 
Right. They predate the dinosaurs. That is amazing. So a very successful design. So tell us about these indigenous leaders from New Zealand who want to uh, give whales personhood to protect them. Oh, I love this. So do I. These folks, these are people from New Zealand, Tahiti, Tonga, and the Cook Islands. And they signed a treaty to, to guarantee uh, whales as persons freedom of movement, cultural expression, and a healthy environment. And the reason that these folks, the Maori and their relatives um, in that whole area uh, care so much about whales is that in their creation story, they came to New Zealand, Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud, either on the backs of whales or they came in canoes following whales. So they consider whales their sacred animal. And um, I think it is just fantastic. I mean, whales are so endangered in our seas by so many things, by climate change and, and, chip, and uh, ship strikes and fishing entanglement and noise. And they're so valuable to our world and they have incredible culture, they have individual personalities. I, I love that they're doing this. And it is part of a trend, too, because in that same article, did you see that there's other animals and even rivers that have been granted legal personhood? Bees in, in Costa Rica, I yeah. read about this oh, morning, right? In, 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 leatherback, um, in Panama, leatherback sea turtles. Mm. But in the U.S., there's a river, the Klamath River, that has been protected similarly. In Ecuador, there is a reserve that has been granted constitutional rights not to be mined. And a lake in Florida had actually sued to protect itself from being polluted. And, and this, this is wonderful. When I think of the word person, person doesn't mean people. I mean, we know all about corporations supposedly being people or being persons, but person, the, the word goes back to an ancient word that means mask of God or an expression of God or an expression of the creator. And really, rivers and whales and bees and leatherback sea turtles, they all are just as much as we are persons, part of the expression worn or the mask worn by the creation. You are unbelievable, Cy Montgomery. Hey, Cy, before you go, are you about to say something? Well, we have a couple of texts Oh, here. let's hear them, sure. Here's one about the cicadas. This is from Mike in Walpole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cicada, cicada in the sky. Why'd you do that in my eye? Gee, I'm glad the cows don't fly. <laughs> and Marjorie from, I mean, Carol from Watertown wants to know if I, that would be Marjorie, yeah. saw dead crabs or just shells that were left by a healthy crab shedding, shedding their skin. I don't know. I saw a lot of shells. I thought I saw little little legs in them, but I could be wrong. So should I be not concerned about all these these shells of, of horseshoe crabs I see along well, they, the they shed um, they they shed the shell around their legs. They have they have an external skeleton or exoskeleton right. yep. as do spiders. And if you've ever seen I, I don't know, you probably vacuum, but I don't so I have plenty of exoskeletons of spiders around of course uh, do. in the basement. Uh, and it looks like it's a spider, but it's really just his, his shed exoskeleton. So I hope that is so. I hope but that is so, too. A lot the of what? animals do eat them. It's so what? Quick, what? What'd you say? Um, it, a lot of animals do eat them, though, and they'll flip them upside down. And seagulls, for example. Yeah, will, that's what I was afraid of. It was seagulls yeah, pecking might, them to death. Yeah, yeah. Could, although, you know, gulls, you wouldn't believe this. I mean, even though they're stealing our lobster rolls right about They right are. Out, yes. Tell me about uh, it. Gulls of all species are experiencing a horrendous decline. And you wouldn't necessarily think this at some beaches, but it is true. So they probably, if, if they're eating a horseshoe crab, at least they're not eating your lobster roll. Well, let me just tell you, not only would I not like to be under a cicada, I would not long, like to be under a seagull, if you know what I mean. <laughs> hey, I okay. Cy Montgomery, you are fabulous. It is wonderful to talk much. to you, as always. Thank you so much. We've been and so to you. And we to have you. been speaking with natural She's author Cy Montgomery. The Her best. latest book is Of Time and Turtles, Amazing. Mending the World, Shell, 
by Shattered Shell. Okay, we are done for the, for today. Thank you very much for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. Thank you for people that came down Thank you to the all. Boston Public Library. It. Thank you. Uh, happy birthday, rather, to John, John Parker. Fla- Parker, John, happy we birthday, hope you have a John. wonderful day today. You can tune in tomorrow. Some Ayanna Presley is going to be with us. Chuck Todd is back. We're going to talk to him about a lot of things, including the dust up at NBC over there hiring briefly a election denier. We're going to talk with former Massachusetts Secretary of Public Safety Andrew Cabral, UMass pollster uh, Tatisha Netta, and Boston Globe columnist Shirley Young. We want to thank our crew Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Nicole Garcia, Hannah Loss, our engineer, whose birthday is today, John McClaw Parker. Word on the street, as we said, that this is his lucky day, and we're honored to have John on board. We want to thank as well our executive producer, Jane Bologna. You've got to see the eclipse in person, and we missed out, Jim, is all I can say. Everybody's it was pretty about great it. on the roof at GBH, well, too. Maybe not, not as, as great. Not as great. It was good. Anyway, special thanks to our BPL team, Maddie Geyer, Matthew Glover, Carly Cochran, Isabella Karen, and thanks to our hosts at the Newsfeed Cafe and the guys across the street at the Lennox Hotel. Stay tuned to the Culture Show with Jared Bone that is starting right after the 2 o'clock news here at GBH 89.7. I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jim Browdy. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Hope you can tune in tomorrow. We have a podcast. If you haven't heard enough of us, one three hours and one a half hour, you can get the Boston Public Radio aptly named podcast. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.